Hello folks, welcome back. Um, I'm quite excited about this stream actually for a couple of different, different reasons. Um, the first one is that it's been a while since I did just like a pure live coding stream. Like this won't be a crust of rust. This won't be a sort of educational stream in, in the sense of the, the crust of rust streams that I've done in the past. Instead, this is one where like we have a programming problem and we're just gonna like dive in and write a bunch of code and see if we can make things work. The other reason that I'm excited is because this is a project that um, I, like I'm kind of proud of. Like I think this is a really cool concurrency primitive and I'll, I'll explain it as we go a little bit. Um, and the other day I had this like realization that I could do something cooler with it. Again, I will explain what that means. And so I've been like excited for the stream for like several weeks now. Um, and so when it just barely lost the Twitter poll of which stream to do next, I was a little sad and, uh, and why I immediately went to this one uh, next. So here's what we're gonna do. Um, this stream is gonna be on a project called EVMAP. Um, and EVMAP is something I built for um, I built for Noria for my PhD thesis work, and essentially it is a is a concurrent hash map, but it's a concurrent hash map that is heavily optimized for reads, um, and it it um, puts a lot more onus on the writer to do locking than on the readers, and the readers basically get to be uh, completely lock free. Um, they are the reads are very very fast. They scale very well. In fact. If you scroll down here, I think there's a chart of like, as you increase the number of readers, the throughput for the readers just goes up linearly with the, with the, the number of readers, um, no matter how many writers there are. Uh, and that's a really cool property for a concurrency primitive. Um, but, and I'll explain how it works in a second. The downside of it is that um, this implementation was written very specifically for Noria's use case. Um, and you can see that if you start reading a little bit of the description of the data structure. So it, it's a lock-free, eventually consistent, concurrent multi-value map, which is a, a mouthful. Um, the lock-free part is that there are no locks and readers, in fact, um, never have to wait on writers at all. At all. So it's like wait-free for reads, but I don't want to use the term wait-free because I don't know whether I completely understand the like theoretical ramifications of that word, um, but, but pretty close to it. Um, eventually consistent in the sense that the writer the writer can choose when to expose changes to the reads. Uh, they don't become immediately um, visible to readers. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. It's concurrent, so you can use it for multiple threads at the same time. Uh, and in particular, it's concurrent for reads. So there's only one write handle. There's only one writer. Uh, if you wanted to have multiple writers, they would have to serialize through a lock. Uh, but it's concurrent for reads. So you can have many, many readers, and they don't contend with one another. Um, and it's multi-value. So the idea here is that where a normal hash map is from key to value, a multi-value map is from a key to a set or a bag of values. Um, and, uh, and that means that it has some kind of weird restrictions. Um, so um, I've had a number of people file like issues with it. Uh, and, and let me see if I can explain this a uh, little bit more detail sort of before we dive into the technical things of, of how this works. So. Uh, the idea with a multi-value map is that you can, this is just sort of the same way that um, standard hash maps work, right? You have an insert, you have keys, you have values. Uh, but one difference is that because it's a multi-value map, uh, we can insert multiple values for the same key. And now if you fetch out uh, a given key, um, you get back all the values for that key, not just the latest one. Uh, and here you also see this refresh operation, right? So we inserted these, but then we did a get, and that get still returned one for Grimm's fairy tales until we call refresh on the writer. And at that point, the reader actually sees the, the changes that we made. Um, and th there are a number of implications of doing the map this way, which is once you have a once you have the value bag uh, actually be a bag and not a single value, um, you get into some complications because people need to be able to remove a given value from the value set for a key. Um, and you can see this in 
if we look at a right handle, for example, you'll see that not only do we require that the key is hashable and can do equality, but we require that the value uh, implements eek and hash too. And that's because if I want to remove a given value, I need to be able to compare values. So values need to implement eek. Um, and in order to store the value set efficiently, we store the values themselves in a hash map or actually technically in a hash bag. Um, and so the values also need to implement hash. And this is, uh, this is pretty onerous. Like you might not think about this very often, but usually when you use a hash map, the, the values are like arbitrary things. Like you might want to stick like channels in there or something, right? The send half of a channel, but the send half of a channel is neither eek nor hash. Um, and so this, this requirement is pretty sad. Um, and so this, this kind of question comes up in a, uh, in a couple of different ways. One is, uh, that storing the value, the value set as like a larger collection, as opposed to a single element means that we're sort of wasting memory for anyone who wants to use it only as a single value map. Someone who wants to use it just as a regular key value map. And so there's been a bunch of questions of like, how hard or easy would it be to move this to uh, something that is just what, like key to value? Um, and similarly, people have had questions about like, why is there a hash and eek requirement? Is there a way that we can get rid of it? Uh, or is there a way that we can get rid of it only in certain use cases? Um, and the answer to that so far has sort of been no, that if you wanted to remove the multi-value part of this, you would basically have to re-implement the whole thing. Uh, and the whole thing is fairly complicated. So it would be a little sad to have to keep a fork of this whole data structure just to support like a single key value map, for example. Which then brings me to um, the topic for today's stream. So about two weeks ago, I had this idea for how we might be able to make EVMAP generic over the collection that it is concurrent over. Um, so that way you can have sort of an EVMAP that holds a regular hash map or that holds a multi-value map or that holds a B-tree map or something like it. Um, and we'll get into the details of this in a little bit, but, but first I want to explain uh, how EVMAP actually works because we're going to dive pretty deep into the guts of it and it's important to have an idea um, for how these things fit together. Um, I'm also going to do some questions because I saw there were some questions that came in while I was discussing this uh, on the topic of EVMAP itself. Um, so let's see. Um, this is not based on Flurry Map. Uh, so for those of you who may have seen some of my earlier videos about uh, porting the concurrent hash map from Java to Rust, uh, that ended up with a, um, a crate called Flurry. This is not Flurry. This is a completely different data structure that I actually built long before I built Flurry. Um, and the use case is fairly different. So Flurry is built as a fully concurrent map where you have concurrent reads and writes. Uh, EVMAP is specifically built for the case where you have many readers and you want as little overhead for readers as possible. Um, it is an epic based map, sort of. Uh, I'll explain that in a second. Uh, and yes, this is the data structure that I described briefly in a, a talk I gave like a year and a half ago or something, maybe two years ago now, um, on uh, writing a concurrent database in Rust. Um, and I'll link that video when I post the video on demand as well. Um, yeah, let's see. Is it conceptually a set of key value pairs? Uh, no, it's conceptually it's a map from a uh, key to a bag of values. A bag differs from a set in that uh, th each value in the set can also have a uh, sort of multiplicity, like a count. So you can have multiple elements that are the same in a bag. Uh, will there be any performance improvements? Um, I don't think this is gonna improve performance. Uh, that seems unlikely. Um, it's hopefully it's going to keep the same performance. Uh, does the EV and EV map stand for something? Yeah, it stands for eventual. So the idea here is that, uh, the map is eventually consistent in the sense that only when the writer chooses to synchronize with the readers, uh, are the results actually displayed to readers. And that will be pretty clear. Um, once I show you how it works behind the scenes, 
Uh, if value requires hash, then how can you have multiple of the same? Um, well, I mean, just because the value is hash doesn't mean that I you disallow duplicates, right? This is just a way to efficiently store that bag um, of values so that you can uh, efficiently remove something if you choose to. Okay, so let me explain how uh, EVMAP works. And for that, we're gonna have to do a little bit of drawing. Um, let's see here. So, um, I think what we're gonna do here is start out with a nice blue color, something like that. All right, so the, the core idea in EVMAP is that we're gonna keep two maps instead of keeping one map. So we're gonna have one map over here and we're gonna have a copy of the map over here. Um, and if you imagine that all reads come from above and all writes come from below, uh, then the, the basic structure we're gonna have is that all the writes are gonna go to one map and all the reads are gonna go to the other map. Um, as long as this is the case, there's no synchronization needed, right? The writer knows that it's the only writer that accesses this map, and so it can just do as many writes as it wants. Uh, the readers know that there's no one writing to their map, so they don't have to synchronize at all. They can just read directly from the map. Great. So far, so good. The challenge, of course, is what happens if, you, if the writer has made a bunch of writes and wants to expose those writes to the reader. Currently, the reader or readers will never see any of the modifications that the writer makes. So the way we're going to do this is that um, this, oh, this pointer up here with the readers, this pointer here, is going to be an atomic. Uh, and the writer has a mechanism for atomically swapping that pointer to point over here instead. Great. So that part is pretty easy, right? Um, the writer just does all the modifications it wants to this map and then swaps over to re the readers to this side. And now the writer is going to move over to this side. Okay. That seems fine so far. But now uh, we run into two problems. The first of these problems is that there might be some readers who are still in the process of reading this map. So they read the, the atomic pointer before we did the swap, and so they're still stuck in the map on the left. Um, this means that the writer can't start modifying the map on the left because there might still be readers in it. So the writer needs to have some mechanism for waiting for all the readers to depart. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. The other thing is that the map on the left doesn't have all of the modifications that the writer has already made in the past to the map on the right. The map on the left is the old value of the map from the previous time that the writer did the swap. So we're actually going to require that the writer keep an uh, operational log, um, also often called just an op log. Uh, and the op log is going to log every change that the writer makes. So this might be something like uh, insert key value. This might be remove key. Uh, this might be clear. Who knows, right? So it's going to keep a log of all the operations it made. This also means that it needs to keep a copy of the key and value for each such operation. And then when it moves to the other map, then it's going to read out these values, this, this part of the op log, and it's going to reapply it to this map first, and then it's going to start doing its other operations. And those other operations then are also going to go to the op log. Right? So this is the way for the writer to make the, the stale map on the left uh, become equal to the map it just left for the readers. So that at that point forward, it can continue to just do normal operations. Um, does that make sense so far? Uh, I know there's, a, there's like a lot of detail here, but let me uh, pause here before I explain how the writer knows that the readers have moved on. Um, as a reader, can we choose to read in an eventually consistent mode and atomic mode? Uh, no. So the readers always go through whatever the current value of this pointer is. Um, so there's no there's no modes for the reader. It's just they read the pointer, whatever the current value is. They go to that map and they read from that map. Uh, that's all the reader has to do. 
Um, and that will be whatever the writer has chosen to reveal. Um, and this swap, by the way, we call a, a refresh. Uh, I believe if you refresh every write, then it's basically fully consistent. Yeah, that's right. Um, if you call if you call refresh after every write, then readers will always see the latest write. Um, and so that is that is a way to use this data structure to provide fully consistent reads. Um, uh, for every insert into the map, you have to do two allocations, one in the actual map and one in the op log. Um, not quite. So the operate the key and value is is given to us by the caller, right? The caller does like an insert, and that gives us an owned value of the the key and value in most cases at least, right? So we can just stick those in the op log, and then we do need to clone them. So we need to do one allocation for um, uh, for sticking it into the the map proper. Now, you might also observe that once we apply this op log to the left side, what we end up with is every key and every value will be present in both maps, right? Because it has to be, the, the two maps are, are copies of each other. So there is this trait uh, called uh, shallow copy um, that uh, is, is a part of EV map. I wrote it as a part of EV map. And it basically just has, it has one unsafe method called shallow copy. And the idea of shallow copy is to um, copy a value without copying its allocation. So for example, imagine that you have a box T, right? Um, you can make another box T by taking the pointer out of this one and stuffing it into that one. Now this is clearly unsafe, right? Because now you have two owners for the same heap allocated value. Um, but as long as you're careful about only dropping one of them and only dropping that one after the other one has been um, has been forgotten and that there are no pointers to it anymore, this turns out to be safe. So the idea is that if, if the value type here was box and this had a B1 and this has a B1, has, uh, and another instance of B1, so they both point to the same PV allocation, then uh, the only thing we need to be really careful about, reading both of these at the same time is fine, is that when B1 is removed from the map, the first time it's removed, we just forget it. The second time it's removed, we drop it. Right, so these two are different, and we have to make sure that the second time we apply in a given operation is when we actually drop, and the first time we don't actually drop. Um, and this can be fairly tricky to get right, and, and you'll see some of that in the code later. Uh, but it does mean that we don't have to duplicate all the allocations. Um, does keeping copies degrade performance? It shouldn't, um, because these still point to the same heap allocation. Uh, while applying the updates from the stack, are new updates blocked? Yes, they are. So um, the there is only support for a single writer in EVMap at a time. You can't have multiple writers. Uh, and the when the writer does a refresh, that refresh swaps the pointer, um, applies the, wait for the readers to depart, and I'll explain that in a second, and applies the op log. So refresh won't return until then. And refresh takes a mute self, so no other operations can happen on the map. Although reads can still happen. It's just that other writes can't happen. The writer never blocks reads in the scheme. Uh, is there a point where the writer has too many ops in the log and just chooses to clone the map over? No. Um, th there, it That might be a reasonable optimization at some point, but currently that hasn't really been something that's come up, no. Um, especially, it, it, all it depends on is how often you refresh. Right, so the caller has control over how long the op log is. If you refresh after every write, your op log is only ever size one, and so it doesn't really matter. Um, and so if the if the client thinks that the op log is too long, they can just choose to refresh. Um, uh, what could go wrong with letting readers that started before the write operation still read from the old structure? So the problem with the old readers, the readers in blue here, um, is that we can't we can't start or the writer can't start to modify the left map until all the readers have departed because otherwise you have a read write data race uh, which is not okay. Uh, wouldn't an arc t also work? 
Um, we could store, we could wrap every value and every key in an arc, but that would mean that we have to do an extra allocation for each operation, uh, which is unnecessary. Like we can just alias the box. In fact, shallow copy is also implemented for arc because it's it's trivial to, to shallow copy an arc. Uh, is the op log bounded? Uh, the op log is bounded by when you call refresh, uh, but it's not bounded internally. Uh, could this work with more than one writer? Um, so the, the way you do this with more than one writer is you have them, you have a, so the, the read handle type is basically clone, like you can get many of them. The write handle type is not. Um, and so you would stick the write handle type in a mutex. That way you can have multiple writers. Uh, if you actually want a concurrent writers, I don't have a scheme that works for that, but it might be possible. Uh, what's the condition the writer chooses to do the refresh? The writer does a refresh um, whenever they decide to. So if they want strong consistency, they swap after every, or they refresh after every write. Um, otherwise, they just refresh sort of infrequently. Think of it as batching updates. They choose how often they want to batch or how long the batches should be. Um, could the op log just store what keys are dirty and then update the old map from the new one? It could, but um, that also gets pretty bad, especially if you have something like a multi-value map where you might have a value set that has like a thousand elements in it. If you insert one element, you don't really want to copy a thousand elements in the map, like delete the old key, like the 999 keys, uh, the 999 element value set for the key and then copy over a thousand elements. You'd rather just do the insert. There might be cases where it's cheaper to just um, have the op log just record read from the other map. Um, it gets really complicated though, because the op log, remember if the op log have, has many entries in them, you sort of need to do those operations in order, right? Uh, so imagine that there's an operation that's like an insert followed by a clear, right? you can't do the insert by reading from the other map because the other map also has the clear operation applied, which if you did the clear op, which means that its value set is empty. So um, it, it's not quite that straightforward. Um, in theory, maybe you could map like all these keys are dirty uh, at the end of the op log and then just copy those over, but then you potentially end up doing a lot more work than, than you technically need to. Um, do you really have a box there if the pointer is not unique? Yes, we're aliasing the box. Um, so th it's definitely unsafe code, uh, but it's okay as long as you only ever access it um, uh, as a read only and you only drop it once and there's no use after free. Uh, Uh, let's see. Doesn't have two box T to the same allocation break aliasing. Internally, they have unique T. Uh, it's fine as long as you don't use them mutably, which we don't. Uh, do all, what about iterators? Do all iterators have to be dropped before the old copy is con considered without readers? Yes. Uh, so the, when a read, and this is a good sort of transition to epochs, um, when a read reads this atomic pointer and say it, it reads the old value, like before the refresh, it now has a pointer uh, into this map. Like it knows of the, the, let's uh, go back to the blue here, right? So a reader that reads out this map and is now operating on this map, it is in that map until it, no longer accesses that map, right? If it has an iterator uh, and it walks that iterator, it's still holding up that uh, that map. If the writer were to just like go ahead and do its writes, it would be concurrently modifying what the reader is currently reading, which is not okay. Um, and so, and so this is this would not be okay. Uh, and in fact, any operation that the reader continues to do on this map must hold up the writer. It's only when the reader eventually finishes this operation and returns and then reads the atomic pointer again, it's only at that point that we know that the writer can um, can keep going. Uh, Is it worth trying to optimize the log by looking at clears and removes before executing the inserts? Um, maybe, I don't think it's worthwhile. I don't think that 
optimizing the op log makes a difference here. Remember, this data structure is written for when you have a lot of reads. The op log is free as far as that is concerned because it's a write operation. Uh, it's true that maybe you could speed up writes a little, but it wouldn't affect reads, and we care only about reads in this case. Um, and in the, in this stream, I will not be focusing on the op log. I mean, it's going to be a part of the implementation we're going to do, but um, we're not going to try to optimize the op log. Uh, are you planning on exposing shallow copy as his own crate? It doesn't look like it's currently available outside eBay map. Um, no, I don't want to expose shallow copy because it like it is a very dirty hack that requires extreme care to use correctly. So I don't think it's a good idea for other people to use it. Uh, arc box would work. Yeah, I mean, you could you could use an arc to, to deduplicate these values as well, but it would require both an extra pointer indirection and an extra heap allocation for every key and value, which is just not worth it. Okay, so now the question becomes, uh, how does the writer know when there are no readers left in the map? And for that, we're going to start a new drawing. Uh, so we're going to have, let's say here, uh, reader one, reader two, reader three, and reader four. Uh, and we're going to have the writer down here. And um, what we're going to do is every reader is going to have an epic counter. And this epic counter is not global. Like many epic counter schemes are global. This one is not. Every reader is going to have uh, an epic counter, which you can think of as it's really just a number. Um, but I'm going to write it. Uh, OK, fine. We'll do it simply first. So like 7, 9, 10, and this one is at 74. Uh, so these are just the local epic counters for each um, for each reader. And the writer is going to have a, a pointer to every epic counter. So it, it has a way to get at every reader's epic counter. So here's what the, uh, the rule is going to be for how readers update their, their epic counter. Um, when, when a reader wants to do a read, uh, so just before it reads the uh, atomic pointer, it's going to increment its epic counter. Then it's going to do all the. It's going to read the atomic pointer. It's going to do all the operations it wants on whatever map it uh, it gets back, and then it's going to increment its epic counter again. Uh, so this means that a reader that is inactive or is outside the map uh, is going to have an even epic counter number, right? Because it's a double increment, an increment on enter and an increment on exit. But crucially, these increments are local increments, right? They increment only their epic counter. Uh, and that value is not normally shared. It's not shared with any other reader. And the writer will only be accessing it if, there, if it's trying to do a refresh. Uh, so this means that in general, if you think about it in terms of like CPU cache coherence, uh, that epic counter cache line is going to be um, uh, in exclusive mode for the CPU that's running that reader. Uh, and this means that the the even though it is an atomic update of a number, it's a, a sort of CPU local uh, atomic update. Uh, in general, the CPU will already have the lock on that particular cache line. So it should be very fast. And then the, what the writer is going to do is the writer is going to, one, uh, swap pointer, two, read all epics, and then three, read all uh, odd epics again until they change. Um, okay, so this is this part is a little weird. Um, so the writer is going to swap the pointer, right? And then it's going to read every epic counter. Um, and when it reads every epic counter, uh, it's either going to see that that value is even or it's going to see that that value is odd. If the value is even, that means that the reader, at the time when it did the, when the writer read the epic, the reader was inactive. Uh, so that means that it, the reader cannot be in the old map. 
if the reader was to immediately after do an operation, it would read the atomic pointer, but we've already done the swap, so it must be looking at the new map instead. So any epic counter that we see is even, we know that that reader is sort of safe. Like we know that it has, it is no longer in the old map. It might be idle or it might be in the new map, but both of those are fine. Any epic counter that's odd um, might mean that that reader is still in the old map. And so we need to continue to sort of recheck um, to, to detect when the reader has moved on. Well, when has the reader moved on? Whenever their epic counter increases, we know that they must have left the old map. And it might increase by a lot. The readers might be really fast and might be faster than how often the, the writer rechecks this value. Um, if the value is incremented by one, that's still enough because it means that if it, if it was odd and it's incremented by one, that means it's now even, which means that it's now no longer accessing the old map and therefore it's safe for us to use it. So the algorithm here is actually fairly straightforward for when it's safe for the writer to continue. Um, does that roughly make sense so far? Uh, does it do anything to handle starvation of writers? There's no lock here. Um, the only, well, I, so the answer to your question is no. Um, the, if a reader just continues to hold on to the, like imagine a, a reader takes out an iterator to the old map and then just like walks that iterator really slowly or just holds on to it, but doesn't drop it. Um, then yes, that will hold up the writer indefinitely. But as long as readers are, um, as long as readers are doing things, the writer will get to go, right? Because remember, the writers, the write and read here are completely independent, right? If a if a read if if a reader does a read and then does another read, that second read might come from the new map. At which point, the the writer can continue. Um, if what if the counter rolls over, um, the if the counter rolls over, that's something that EVMAP doesn't handle, but it's a U64 counter, so it seems highly unlikely. Um, in theory, there might be a way to... Well, in theory, I could make the... It might be safe for the readers to like reset when they hit even or something, but it's not quite that simple because the writer is waiting for a value that's higher. Um, but yeah, it's a little unclear. Um, you run into a potentially really bad case where the writer, the, the writer continuously see the reader as being odd, uh, but the value starts going down uh, and the writer gets very confused. So I don't, I don't think rollover is really a problem in the sense that rollover just doesn't really happen in U64s. Do we have any more use of the epic apart from signaling to the writer? Uh, if not, why don't we keep the values to zero and one? It can't be zero and one. Uh, and the reason for this is, imagine that we swap the pointer, then we read all the epics and we find that some reader's count is one. And then we read their epic again and their counter is one. And then we read the epic again, and their counter is one. The reader might have moved on from the old map to the new map, but we can't tell because we only have the binary yes or no. The fact that the epics keep increasing means that we can we can sort of figure out what round the reader is on. Uh, and this is important because if they're on another iteration, like if, if they have read the pointer again since last time you checked, then it's safe for the writer to move forward. Uh, and you don't get that with zero and one. Uh, the counters are all atomics, yeah. Uh, Yeah, so the, there are a bunch of people asking, like, can't you just have this be a yes, no flag? And no, you can't. Uh, or rather, if you did, the writer will end up waiting potentially a very long time uh, before they can move forward because they might always see that the reader is in like a pending state and then it doesn't know that it's safe to move forward because it can't distinguish between the reader has was in pending, went to idle, and went to pending again. It's the ABA problem. Like you don't know whether the reader has moved on or not. So you need to be pessimistic about it. Whereas with the incrementing epics, um, then you always know whether or not the reader has moved on. Uh, can we assume that the readers can be from different threads? Yep, the read handles are uh, different threads. Uh, can the writer check if the reader's counter is different instead of greater? Uh, maybe. 
maybe uh yeah that might be a way to fix rollover that the writer just waits for the epic to not be the same as it was you might be right that might be sufficient um how can the readers write their epics and the writer read the epics without locks? Um, so Atomic Counters let you do this. Uh, uh, instead of a counter, could you not have a unique ID for each of the two maps for the readers to supply to the writer? Like the reader said, I'm on map zero. Um, you could do that, but the readers would need to... So the way you would have to do that is the readers would store like which pointer they're at probably rather than zero and one because there's no left and right in, in memory, right? Um, but I guess they could probably store the pointer of their current map. I don't think it makes a difference. I think these are about the same. Um, so yeah, that could probably be, um, that could be fine. Um... Yeah, yeah, so I think it could be a pointer instead of a counter. Uh, one thing that's nice about this is, uh, yeah, no, I think you're right. I think it could be a pointer. Uh, it feels like there'd be a race if you stored the map pointer, so you'd have to read it and then store it. I don't think that's a problem. Uh, because... As long as you use the pointer you read, I think it's fine. Oh yeah, no, you're right. Um, you might read the, okay, so this is the reason you can't use the pointer. Uh, that's a good good observation. So uh, the proposed scheme is that every reader, instead of storing an epic counter, stores the pointer of the map that they're accessing. Imagine that the following scenario happens. A reader reads the atomic pointer, um, and then it, it needs to read it in order to write it into its sort of local storage, right? But there's a gap in between those two operations. Like imagine the reader reads the pointer and then the writer squeezes in in between before it writes out the pointer of the map that it's using. And the writer sees the old value for the pointer and goes, oh, this one is on the map that, uh, the, this one is already on the new map, so it's safe for me to proceed. And so the writer continues to do writes, assuming that the reader is on the old map. But then the reader stores the new map pointer in there, but it's too late because the writer has already moved on. Um, so this is the reason it can't be the pointer. Nice, good catch. All right, so now that we have the scheme in mind, um, there's also an optimization that EVMAP makes, which is that um, it it turns out you can be a... So the... the, the um, uh, how to explain this? Um, I need a color green or whatever. Okay, so uh, this step is super fast, right? This is just an atomic pointer swap. Um, this one is also super fast because you're just reading all the epics. This one though might take a really long time because uh, it might be that there's some reader that's like really slow and hasn't moved on. Um, and every time you call refresh, you sort of have to do all these three steps. And this last step taking a long time means that your refresh is gonna take a long time. So it, uh, it turns out that you can be a little bit smarter about this and you can have that wait time overlap with when, um, you can have that, that, that wait time overlap with the code between different refreshes. So the idea is to have refresh return here and then only apply writes at the beginning of the next refresh. So we're gonna add a step zero, which is apply writes. Uh, and now this is gonna be the first, this, is, this whole thing is gonna be the first step of the next call to refresh. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna have, whenever you do an operation on a writer, it's not actually gonna modify the, the write map, um, the one that we currently have a write handle to. Instead, it's only gonna push to the op log. So if you do an insert, it will not modify the map, it will just add to the op log and nothing else. Uh, and this means that now it's actually safe for us to return from refresh right here because uh, 
and we were not actually going to modify the map while we're waiting. Um, because in the interim, after call ring refresh, all the writes we do are just going to go to the op log anyway. And then the next time refresh is called, then we're going to do this wait first. And the, at that point, almost all the writers are, are, they're like almost guaranteed to have moved on because it might have been a really long time between the calls to refresh. So we're almost guaranteed that all the epic counters have, have either incremented or become, um, or become even. Um, and so that means that now every call to refresh is actually fast because the right, the, this sort of the minus one step, which is this one, right? This one is likely to be fast because it's been a really long time since we read all the epics. This one is going to be pretty fast because it's just applying a bunch of writes to something that we're the only ones modifying. And then we swap the pointer and then we read all the epics. So we're just sort of offsetting the cycle a little bit so that we can uh, overlap the waiting with the writer doing other operations that they do be between calls to refresh. Does that optimization seem roughly right? Um, uh, so with that optimization, we can no longer read through the writer. That's correct. Um, the writer, the, you cannot read from the right handle to see what the current state of the map is. You could, so in theory, you could do this by doing a read from the map and then walking the op log to figure out, um, walk the op log and like apply them to your return value. Um, but it gets pretty complicated, but it does make refreshes a lot faster. So it, it's definitely a trade-off. Um, but in general, the writer is unlikely to, or at least in my experience, the writer is unlikely to, to really care about the reads. Think of it as all reads, regardless of whether they come from the read handle or the write handle, go to the read map. Um, um, does this mean that on average the op log is twice the length as one refresh cycle? Yeah. So the op log has to hold, this actually means that the op log is a little bit more complicated. Uh, the op log holds both um, values we haven't applied to the write map and values we haven't applied to the read map. So the op log has sort of this like uh, watermark in it of everything up to here you've applied to the write map but not the read map and everything beyond this watermark you've applied uh, to neither map. Um, all right, great. So now that you have an understanding of uh, how EV map fits together, I think it's time to look at some code. And I'll try to explain, actually, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna back, go back to this um, suggestion I had, which is currently EV map is, is hard coded to deal with multi-value maps. Like the op log is like, the values of the op log are an enum called operation, and it has operations like insert, delete, uh, uh, empty, which is for removing all the values for a key, uh, set, which is to replace the value set rather than append to it, um, and a couple of other operations that are that are less interesting. Um, it's hard coded to like have both things be a map. It's hard coded to the the value. The values of the map are of type like value set or value bag, um, and that's kind of sad because if you th if you think back to this uh, this design, there's nothing about this design that's map specific, right? You can have an op log over all sorts of structures. So you can have an op log over a vector. You can have an op log over a hash set. You can have an op log over a B tree map. Um, you can have an op log over whatever your own data structure is. Um, and so the, and the sort of the epic scheme and the choosing when to use which of the two collections, that part is entirely data structure agnostic. And so it's kind of sad for the, the sort of, at least in my opinion, coolness of the EV map sort of concurrency primitive uh, being limited only to the one implementation that I wrote. I would much rather have this be sort of a, a wrapper concurrency primitive that you could then use for your own data structure. So the question becomes, uh, how can we do that? Well, um, the 
that's basically the the idea I had two weeks ago. And sort of in hindsight, this is very obvious, but early on there wasn't, I didn't have a good idea for how this might work. Um, so the basic idea here is that we're gonna have a, a new type that's gonna be basically a concurrency primitive. Think like mutex, except it's it has very different semantics. Um, I'm calling it left right here for two reasons. Um, one is because there's a left map and a right map, but the other is because there was a um, there was an an announcement back in like I want to say like 2013 or something from someone who's like we've invented a left right concurrency primitive and the the white paper they put out was was very short it was just like a brief description of here's roughly what it does and it looks a lot like evmap and this was before i built evmap i didn't find out about this until a couple of years ago like after i built evmap and i think what they were going for was the same thing as evmap is um but but i don't think they've ever published the actual algorithm um uh, but sort of in, in honor of them being first, I figured let's call it left-right. Um, and so the left-right type is going to be uh, generic over two types, T and O. T is going to be the type of the left and right things. So this would be sort of the hash map key and value bag V for EV map uh, for today. And O, which is going to be the oplog type, that's the enum that we're currently using in EV map today. Uh, and then we're going to have a trait absorb and absorb uh, is gonna be generic over O, the oplog type. And the idea is that it's gonna require that the T, the thing that we're sharing, implements that trait for the given O. Uh, and the trait is apply first and apply second. Um, apply first is the first time you apply a thing from the oplog. So this is when you apply it to the right map. And apply second is the second time you apply a given thing from the oplog, which is when you apply it to the read map. Uh, these need to be uh, these need to be different for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one is that when you apply it the first time, uh, you don't own the value in the oplog because we're, we need the value to remain in the oplog so that we can apply it again. Um, and so you, we can only pass an immutable reference to the, the oplog element. We can't actually give you the element. So it might have to clone or something or use something like uh, shallow clone in order to stick it into the, uh, the right map. And then apply second, we can give in the O. Uh, and the, the other reason why these have to be separate is that if we're using something like shallow copy um, and you're doing something like erasing a value or a key, if that value was shallow copied, then the first time it's removed, we need to forget it instead of dropping it. And the second time it's removed, we need to actually drop it. And so the implementation needs to be able to distinguish between these two cases. Uh, and if we had this kind of primitive, um, then EVMAP as it stands today could just be expressed as left right um, with a hash map of key and a hash and a value bag and an operation where the operations are like a hash map operation uh, of key value. Uh, and what's neat about this is that this, if we had this kind of structure, it'd be trivial to use left, right to implement other kinds of collections in, a, in an efficient way. So for example, if you wanted a hash map that was just key value, you would just have a left, right hash map key value. And the operation type would be something that's operations over a single, um, uh, a single value map. Um, now, there are some other aspects to this, like, um, it, it means that we can't have quite, we, we need like a layer of abstraction in EVMAP to make um, ergonomic access to the, to the underlying map nicer because with the left, right, right handle, all it could really do is have like append operation and refresh because it doesn't know about things like inserts. It can't because it's supposed to be generic. So the idea is that EVMAP would have to also provide like a wrapper type around right handle that has the hash map specific implementations of these methods. Like it would have an actual insert method that just ends up calling append op uh, on the inner right handle. All right, does that, does the, the plan here roughly make sense? Wouldn't you need a generic type constructor to make this work? Like for the same reason, there's currently no collection trait. I don't think so because left right doesn't actually require uh, that the the thing you get is a collection. Like it doesn't require that the thing is a map. 
all it requires is that it can apply things from the op log. Um, so I don't think you need generic type constructors for this. Uh, although like it could be that we start coding this and then we're like, oh damn, this there's no way we can do this. Um, but, but I don't think it should require that. And it, it's specifically because we don't, uh, we're not trying to proxy any particular methods of T. Uh, all we're going to do is like a, a, a deref into, uh, into T. Like this is a wrapper type, not a generic trait. Um, could operations be closures rather than an enum? Um, maybe, I think that would be very hard to work with because you still need something like apply first or apply second. I guess you could have like the entries in the op log are closures that you call on the map. Um, and they're like past the value of whether this is the first or the second, it would make the, the type specification really awkward because uh, you presumably want different closures for different kinds of operations, uh, which would in turn mean that your op log type would be like box din fn mute or something. Um, I mean, it could work. I don't think it's nicer. Um, Uh, collection seems like the natural use case here. Might it be handy to have a non-collection type to keep in mind during implementation? What might that type be? Yeah, I, again, I don't, I don't think this is specific to collections, um, but it is true that all the examples I have in mind are collections. Um, all of what I've written so far is entirely collection or, or um, type independent, right? So apply first and apply second is just, you need to be able to, whatever type you have needs to be able to be modified by an operation um, for, that can be stored in an op log, which is not specific to collections. Um, the only thing we're gonna expose on right handle is append an operation to the op log uh, and the semantics of that operation you get to define yourself. Refresh, which is just now expose the changes. Um, which is also not collection specific. Uh, and then the last thing we're going to do is really just implement deref for uh, the read handle and the write handle into the inner type. So I don't think any of this is written to be collection specific. In terms of having a non-collection type in mind, um, hmm. uh, it might be that, uh, that's a good question. I can't immediately think of a non-collection type you would use here. Um, but then again, I've been wrong before. Yeah, I can't immediately think of one. But but looking at the API, at least it doesn't it doesn't feel like there's anything collection specific in it. Um, yeah, I mean, okay, so uh, it's a good point from comments that like maybe a counter um, or a collection of counters, but like you could maybe have a counter. A counter is a really weird example because like why wouldn't you just use atomics um, instead? Um, but but okay, let's let's take a counter as a sort of straw man example, right? Uh, apply first and apply second would just be apply the uh, the modification to the number that you're storing. Um, right handle would either refresh the count or append an operation that you're going to do to the count, uh, and you could deref into the count whenever you wanted to. So this would work for counter, which is not a collection. Um, well, strings are collections, right? Uh, a string is just a vector of characters, really. Yeah, like a very, very complicated way to do atomic counters. Um, okay, so uh, let's start to actually look at the code here. Um, so EVMAP is currently entirely geared around this, this idea of supporting maps. Um, and so I think what we're actually gonna want to do here is create a new crate that holds this sort of generic version and then have EVMAP wrap that type. Uh, and, and Cargo has a 
good feature for doing this already of sort of bundling things together, which is workspaces. Um, so I think what we're actually going to do is we're going to create, we're going to turn EV map into a workspace that has that type and EV map, uh, where EV map depends on that type. Um, so let me go ahead and start a new here and call it left, right. Um, and ooh, now I need to remember how this works. Um, so we're gonna do, we're gonna make dear left, right. Uh, and actually we're gonna not do that. We're gonna cargo new lib left, right. Um, and then we're gonna make dear EV map and we're gonna get move cargo toml and uh, build rs and source and tests and benchmark into ev map oh why do i have a build rs in here oh that's from something else let's just move that out for the time being uh what else do we have why is it complaining right all right so we moved that um there's also ev map derive so ev map derive is a way to derive um shallow copy safely for types um i forget exactly how this is specified at the moment i think it's currently just like a subdirectory so if you look at ev map uh, cargo toml. I think it has a path dependency, maybe. Oh, it's actually just a separate subdirectory. Okay, so this is going to be even nicer. So we're going to create a cargo toml workspace. Uh, ooh, I always forget what the specification for this is. Uh, cargo manifest format. And I specifically want workspaces. Um, mm -mm. Yeah, so what we want is a virtual manifest. We don't sort of have a primary crate really anymore because it's not clear whether left, right would be the primary crate or EV map would be the primary crate. Um, so I think we're just going to have them be separate. And then we're going to say members. That was the thing I wanted to look up. Members are going to be EV map, uh, EV map derive, and left, right. Uh, and let's just do a cargo check here to see if this actually builds. Yeah, a counter would be a good like minimal unit test is true. Um, fail to get EV map as dependency of package EV map drive. Uh, drive. Cargo Tommel. Let's see if that now builds. That does not build. Ugh, I really don't want to deal with EVMap derive right now. It's just gonna be I'm just gonna ignore it for now. Um, and fix that up later. EV map derive is like, it's not as important for us to fix this, and it's certainly not important for the stream. Great. So EV map itself builds. Uh, I guess I should fix that build error. Broken introdoc links is what it's called now. Uh, like so. Great. All right, so now we can start, uh, I guess I can commit this. Nah, I won't do that yet. All right, so now we can start sort of from, from something that's conceptually just an empty project uh, and then start to add from here. And what we really want to do is we sort of want to start from what EVMap has, right? Because all of the, um, a lot of the types are going to be the same. A lot of the, the concurrency mechanism is going to be the same. So we're actually just going to copy everything from EV map source into here. Um, and then a lot of these things, we're really just going to be removing stuff. Um, so we can get rid of values. So that's not going to be important. Um, ooh, I did a stupid, didn't I? 
I should have moved that into source. So we're gonna move inner lib shallow copy and write into source. And we're also gonna move read into source. Great. Source lib. Um, so evmap sort of root, um, root type or root uh, file doesn't really do much. It, it mostly just um, forwards into types and various modules. So most of this is just gonna be cleanup. Uh, epics, we're gonna end up keeping. Predicate, it's not gonna be used. Uh, operation is no longer gonna be used in here. We are gonna have write handle and we're gonna have read handle and read guard and maybe read handle factory. I'll explain these in a second. Uh, we're not gonna have shallow copy. Um, and we're not gonna have the sort of builder for a map because that's not actually important anymore. Uh, we are gonna have this, um, this n actually we're not even gonna have that, I don't think. We are gonna have a new and new is gonna do what that constructor used to do. Um, and of course, we're gonna have to change the generics here to match like having the, taking the type and the operation. Um, we're not gonna require anything of V anymore because we're not even gonna have a V. Uh, okay, so there's one thing I haven't really talked about, which is meta. Um, meta is mostly uninteresting. The idea is that uh, sometimes you want to communicate to the readers what version they're on, sort of. So you can think of this as like a, an additional little bit of state that you want to include with every swap. Uh, and meta is that information. So the idea is that rather than have the pointer be directly to the map, we're just gonna have the, we're gonna have the pointer be to a struct that we control and it holds the map, but it also holds this extra little bit of meta information. Um, now, now that this is generic, I don't think we need meta anymore because the user can choose to have something that's like a map and some meta information. Um, so I think maybe, I think maybe that can now go away. So we're gonna get rid of meta. It's gonna make things a lot nicer. Um, right, so new, uh, as we talked about before, it's going to take a T and an O, uh, and it's going to return a read handle T O. Um, and what we're going to require is that T implements absorb O. And we are missing the trait absorb. So we're going to have to write that. Uh, and that has an absorb first, which gets a mute self and a mute O. And an absorb second, which gets the actual O. Um, so new is gonna create a new epics. Um, epics here, you'll notice is the, it's a, an arc mutex slab of arc atomic u size, which is quite the mouthful. Um, but basically it is, the writer has a has access to a list of pointers to epic counters. So this inner arc atomic u size, that is the epic counter for each individual readers. Uh, a slab you can think of as sort of like a, you can think of it as a vector, but where we can remove specific elements efficiently um, and we can index them with um, consistent keys. Um, we, we won't be talking too much about slab. You can mostly ignore it. Think of it as a list. Uh, and it's gonna be an arc mutex. And the reason that we have to arc mutex this, even though generally it's only gonna be the writer that accesses this, it's an arc mutex so that you can clone a read handle 
right? So if you have a read handle and you want to construct another read handle from that read handle, basically you want to clone that read handle, the read handle needs to store its epic counter, right? It's going to allocate a new epic counter. It has to store that somewhere where the writer can get access to it. Uh, and so it needs to be able to modify this. Um, and that might happen concurrently with a write. So that's why this has to be an arc mutex. Uh, I guess I should add slab to, I should actually add a bunch of these, but specifically slab is the one we're going to want here. All right. Um, we don't need any of this capacity business. Inner is a type that, um, inner is the thing that gets pointed to by the atomic pointer. Uh, so if we go to the inner file, a lot of this can be simplified too. You see that it holds uh, data, which is basically a map. Um, there's a feature in EVMAP that lets you choose what map implementation to use, um, but it basically just holds the map. It holds the meta and it holds this ready flag. Um, the ready flag we might still need. So the ready flag is there so that uh, if you try to read after the, I forget what I'm using ready for even. Ready. Um, oh, it's... Um, yeah, this is also something that the user can choose to implement. Ready is just used so that if a reader tries to read before the writer has had a chance to write anything, then it gets an error. Um, but I don't think we care about that here. Yeah, I don't think we care about that here. So in fact, the whole inner type just isn't needed anymore. Um, so we can just do git rm sor. Oh, oh, I need to cd into left inner. Uh, just rm source inner. That's nice. I'm that makes me happy. Um, so inner goes away. So really, this is going to give us a read handle t. And we're also going to require the T is clone. Um, and we're actually going to take in the original T, I think. So the idea is that we're going to take in some initial collection. We're going to clone it to get two halves of it. Um, we might not require a clone. We could take a T1 and a T2. Um, so actually, we might provide a second constructor here that takes them explicitly. All right. So we can do this. Right, and then we can have a, a second constructor that's like new with clone, which takes a T that is clone, only takes one T, and then um, just clones to get the two halves. Um, you could even have one that doesn't take a T at all, but takes a T that implements uh, that implements default, and just gives you an empty one. I increase the font size just a little bit. Yes, I can. It's weird. So my screen is 4K, so I'm showing you only a subset of my screen, and then it gets scaled to. 1080. So it's hard for me to estimate what the actual font size you end up seeing is. Um, I'd be worried about a T1, T2 constructor not being marked unsafe because there's no guarantee they're the same. That's true. This does require that they are the same. All right, let's go with this then. I mean, even if you take clone, you're not guaranteed that they're the same. They might have different hashing algorithms, for example. But what's neat is that it that doesn't matter. If you have, like HashMap, for example, can be used with EVMAP and it's fine because um, the right operations you do have the same effect regardless, unless you already use unsafe APIs, like accessing things by hash value or something. Um, basically, so EVMAP does require that the, or the, this primitive requ does require that the operational log is deterministic over the T. Um, 
All right. So what are we going to do here? We're going to have, um, T dot clone and T. Right, so we're gonna give one clone of the T to the first read handle and one clone of the T to the first to the right handle. That might make a good doc comment, yeah, you're right. So here's what we're gonna do. Uh, Note, this is a note to self, like a note to developer. Uh, document that operations must be deterministic. Um, I think there already is a doc comment to this effect in EVMAP itself. Um, but I think it's like an internal comment or something. Um, all right, so this alone just simplified this file a lot. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and remove all this documentation because it's map specific uh, and I don't want it there. And I'm going to, for the time being, remove the warning for missing docs. Um, don't need this, don't need format, don't need build hasher. Great. So this file is already a lot simpler. That makes me, makes me very happy. Um, so now we have read and write. Um, and I think let's start with write because write is where most of the complexity comes from. Um, so we're going to want to pull in the absorb trait, but that's probably all we need from super. Uh, there's no longer an inner. Uh, we do need read handle. There's no longer a values. There's no longer any of this hash stuff. Um, so manually drop here is kind of interesting. Um, the idea behind manually drop is that we'd like to err on the side of caution. Like, remember how I said, if we use something like shallow copy, you want to make sure that the first time you remove a value, you forget it. The second time you drop it by wrapping the value in manually drop, what we end up with is that the standard case, if we don't do anything special, is that they will both be forgotten, which is a memory leak, but it's not memory on safety. Um, so, so we do wrap them in manually drop. Um, however, that I don't think that's going to come up here because we're not going to use shallow copy at all. That's a decision of the implementer of this data structure. Um, so I think manually drop can probably go away. The atomics we do need, arc and mutex guard we probably need. Don't know whether we need format, but we'll find out. Um, these docs can go away. Right handle now is gonna take T and O. And again, we're, and we don't even need to specify the, um, the bounds here because we might as well do those just on the refresh operation because that's the only one where we actually care that T can absorb O. So this is a pattern you'll see sometimes in Rust where um, some people put the trait bounds for a type on the type itself and then on every impl block. The idea being that um, you can't use this type if you don't satisfy these bounds, so we're not even going to let you construct them. Whereas if you look at the standard library, for example, it's much more common for the bounds to be on particular methods. So you'll be able to construct a right handle um, that has, say, um, where T doesn't implement absorb O, uh, you just won't be able to do anything with it. And, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is historical, um, where, uh, so there's a feature called implied bounds. I don't know whether it's landed yet. I don't think so. So implied bounds is that if you have where bounds on a type, then every impl block for that type will automatically have those bounds included. So you don't need to write them out. But without that feature, if you had like, like you saw here, right, a long list of where conditions for this type, you have to repeat that list of where clauses for every impl block, even though not necessarily every impl block relies on all these properties. But you sort of made this statement that like this whole type doesn't make sense without all these bounds, and now every impl block needs to repeat them. Uh, and so by not putting the bounds on the struct and instead only putting bounds on the individual methods, uh, you sort of avoid this problem of having to repeat yourself. 
Um, the other reason why you might want it on the type is, is sort of related, which is imagine that someone else wrote a struct that contains a right handle. If I have these bounds be on my right handle, I'm requiring them to put the same bounds on their wrapper struct because they can't have, they can't name a right handle without ensuring that these properties are, are held. If I don't include them here and only have them on the impo block, they will not have to include it on their struct and therefore everywhere in their code base. So in general, I think err on the side of having them on the methods instead. Um, the reason this didn't is I think because index map, at least, which is one of the uh, EV map backends, uh, and hashbag both required, both had these bounds on the struct, and that's why we had to repeat them here. Um, accessing entries by hash is not unsafe though. Oh yeah, you're right. The like raw entry API, I guess, is not unsafe because as long as you guarantee that the hash you get, as you, you yeah, because the hashes are stored internally in the, the handles you get back. Yeah, so I guess really it's unclear where this unsafety should be. It could be that the methods on absorb should be unsafe, to be honest. I'm not quite sure yet. We can look at that in a second. Um, all right, so the right handle is going to hold a box of T, uh, an op log, which is going to be a vec of O. Swap index, which is, remember how I mentioned that the op log has this watermark for everything before, or everything on one side are the things that um, haven't been applied to the right handle or the read handle, and everything on the other side are things that have been applied to the right handle but not to the read handle. The swap index is that watermark. Um, the writer has a read handle, uh, and the reason it needs to have a read handle is so that it has a way to get a pointer to what the read map currently is. So this this is the write map and it gets the read map through here. And this is also what it uses to allow you to read through the right handle. Uh, so this is gonna hold the T and an O. Last epics is, uh, remember how we read all the epics at the end of refresh and then we're gonna read again at the start of refresh and compare them. Last epics is what we read at the end of the last refresh. Um, meta we don't need anymore. First and second are kind of weird. Um, first and second are optimizations where the first time you do a refresh, you don't really need to use the op log. Um, the first time you do a refresh, you can just clone the whole map. Um, but that does rely on the type being cloned. So it depends on whether we want to require the T is cloned everywhere here, or whether we only want to require it in the constructor. I think we're probably gonna get rid of first and second. Um, I don't think they're optimizations that we want to generalize. Uh, and there's, you'll see there's a, a field here called refreshes, which is only enabled during testing. And this is so that we can test how many refreshes happened. Um, like when we're writing a test, we can ensure that it did the the number of refreshes we expect. Yeah, it could be the absorb should be an unsafe trait. Um, uh, epics are U64, but they're U size. Uh, yeah, we should probably fix that straight away. This should be an atomic U64. Um, all right, so we're going to implement debug for TO, where T, oh, it's so nice to get rid of all these bounds. Uh, and I think the op log also needs to implement debug. Uh, right handle, op log, swap index, R handle. There's no meta and there's no first and second anymore. Great. Uh, creating a new right handle now is also pretty straightforward. The right handle is really just going to be a T. It takes an epics, takes a read handle TO, and gives you a right handle TO. 
Uh, we're not actually going to require anything of new here. Um, don't need the meta. Uh, so the, we have to box the T because we're going to use it in like an atomic. So we need to have a pointer to it, um, which means that it, it doesn't need to be heap allocated, but the alternative would be that we need to like take something that can be used as a pointer and it's easier to just box it internally. Um, and notice that this boxing only happens once. Uh, implement drop. Why does it implement drop? I forget. Uh, here we probably require the T implements absorb. I'll show that in a second why that is. Um, so when we drop a right handle, we want to remember how we don't necessarily know whether it's safe to drop or forget a value. Um, and so when we drop a right handle, we really want to like walk through the op log and then do the refreshes so that we can reuse the logic from there to figure out which things are safe to drop and which things we should forget. Uh, and so that's basically what's going on here. This code I think can stay exactly the same as it currently is. Um, this, there's no data anymore in W handle, I don't think. Yep, that can just be a pointer to inside the W handle. So this is gonna be as deref mute unwrap. So this now is a pointer to the thing that the box holds. Uh, recalling when to add bounds directly to a struct, does it make sense to add them if they're needed in drop? I think the compiler actually requires that. That's a good point. Uh, so I think it's actually gonna require that we add this bound here because otherwise we're not allowed to use it in drop. It's a good catch. It's a little sad, but you know. Um, oh, clear is going to be interesting. Uh, hmm. Not quite sure what to do about this one yet. So the, the trick we're pulling here is that in drop, we make sure that the two maps are identical. And then we want to basically erase everything from the first handle before we drop the second. But if we, that's not gonna be nice. Um, mm -mm -mm. Actually, I think, uh, we do actually, we are going to want, uh, where is manually drop again? I thought it was sync, but maybe I'm wrong. Use, where is my, oh, mem, of course it's a mem. What am I thinking? Um, uh, we're going to want this, I think, to be manually drop. Um, and the reason for that is if there's like a panic or something and the right handle gets dropped, it's not safe to drop what's in the right handle. Um, or I guess actually, yeah, because there might still be readers in it. Um, but this one, I'm not entirely sure how we're gonna do. Like we need some way to instruct the, the T to like remove all the elements, but don't drop them. This might have to be like a, like we're gonna require that the operations implement like a clear operation or something. I'll have to look at that in a second. Uh, this one cast that's back into a T. R handle as 
inner. So where do we get the R handle from? Yeah, that's fine. Yep. All that, uh, yeah. Uh, presumably instead of boxy, you could use some unsafery around pointers inside the right handle and the inner part of the read handle. But I think the boxing is way less painful, and so it's not an optimization I consider unless those allocations ever showed up as pain. Yeah, uh, the the other reason I want to do it with box is because it might be a stack value, and then you need to box it. Like, you can't have them share a pointer to a stack value. It wouldn't be safe. Because the pointer has to be stable over time for this to work. Uh, let's see. So, TO for right handle. Um, this is now going to require absorb O on every impl block. Um, so uh, right handle holds a unique pointer to the right collection and right handle is unique. Yes, right handle, uh, well, it's not a unique pointer because there might still be readers in it. It will be unique by the time we use it as mutable. Uh, but right handle is unique, yes. Okay, so weight is a, a sort of a helper function in right handle. And what weight does is basically it does the weighting. Uh, this is specifically the step where you've read the epics before and now you're waiting for all the epics to have, have um, iterated over. I guess this now has to be U64. Um, Yeah, and this is just code to like read all the epics. Um, I lied a little bit when I talked about even and odd. Uh, in practice, it actually uses the high bit. I forget why it uses the high bit. There might not be a good reason. Um, and then it tries to figure out like if the if a counter has if an epic hasn't moved since last time we looked at it, what do we do? Well, we can just retry like. Imagine that there are like three readers or something that still haven't changed. We can just optimistically retry a couple of times because reads in general are pretty fast. But if it takes longer than that, we might actually want to yield the thread uh, to give the readers a chance to run. Um, and so notice that weight didn't have to change at all. There's nothing map specific in weight. Uh, and similarly for refresh, we'll remove the docs because it's too high of a risk that there's something in there about maps, so they should be rewritten anyway. Um, yeah, so it calls. So this is where you'll notice that when you call refresh, it first waits. This is the sort of moving the thing up to the uh, to the top. Um, and this is going to be sdref mute. Uh, we're not going to have the second optimization. Why is there? Why do we have the r hasher? That's interesting. I don't think we care about the hasher. Uh, oh, I remember. So there's a the hasher here is actually kind of interesting. Um, we need to make sure that when we apply operations, we use the hasher of the map that we're modifying, not the hasher of the other map. Uh, and this gets a little complicated at times to keep track of. Um, but I don't think it'll matter here. Uh, this is making sure that we apply the the correct portion of the op log. Um, mm -hmm, apply a second op. And we're not going to pass in the hasher. Oh, I see what's going on here. 
And this might actually be a little hard to abstract away. So when, uh, I'm pretty sure this is wrong. Um, why is it using the same hasher for all the operations? That doesn't seem right. I think something's wrong here. But um, yeah, so, so the, the thought I had was the, the T, when it is told to apply the operation second or first, uh, doesn't really know whether it's applying it to the left or the right map. Although it should use the hasher from the appropriate map. So why is this a problem? It's a problem because Oh, why is it a problem? I think you need to use the same hasher. Otherwise, operations don't end up being a deterministic. But I forget why. I'm going to remove this for now, and then we're going to come back to that later, I think. Um, could you give each of apply first and apply second a reference T of the other collection so we can extract hashers if it needs to? Yeah, that might be the way to go about this. Um, sorry, you said I read it as a U size. Uh, oh, yeah, you're right. Which probably also means that last epics should be a vec of U64s. Yeah. Um, ba, 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 ba. Where were we? Yeah, I think it would be nice to provide a handle to the other thing too. Um, I wonder why this is do drop. I forget what do drop even does. It has been a while since I looked at some of this code. Um, oh, I remember what this does. Oh, that's so sneaky. Um, okay, so this is a modification I made a while back, which was instead of trying to remember, ooh, my hair's crazy. Um, instead of trying to remember um, whether or not it's safe to drop values, I just because manually drop is um, is represented in memory the same way the inner type is, I just cast between the two. So if you're supposed to drop things, I cast to the the thing the the version of the type that doesn't have manually drop for the values. Uh, and if you're applying first, then I don't cast to that type. Um, now that cast can actually happen inside the implementation of apply second and apply first. So let me see, do I even call apply second anywhere else? Uh, yeah, I didn't think so. Okay, so I think uh, this trick is something that can be performed inside the implementer. So that is just gonna go back to be w handle. Um, but I do think you're right that we probably want to pass in the handle to the other thing. So let me pull that back here. So this, instead of being our hasher, is going to be our handle. Handle. Um, and this, instead of being hasher, is going to be, I guess, just inner, probably. 
Yeah, it's gonna be inner dot load. Do I really not use ordering in this type? Oh, atomic, fine. Yeah, notice the comment here that because here we're reading out of the read handle, we are now a reader. So we can't swap while holding this because it would invalidate this handle. Um, well, technically it wouldn't because we wouldn't drop it, but to be on the safe side, we don't want to swap while holding this reference and we won't, I'll show you in a second. So this is also going to pass in the R handle. And this is also going to pass in the R handle. Um, so let me go back to, I guess, lib. So that means that absorb is also going to be given other. This is going to be a reference to T. Oh, uh, a reference to self, actually. Now, this is going to look a little weird because it looks like we're never applying anything to our handle. And that's true, we don't. Uh, but remember that, so like, imagine this being map zero. So this is also map zero. The next time around, we're going to call on this subset of the op log, this is going to be map one. So we're going to apply it to map one on the, the next iteration around. W handle and R handle will be swapped. Um, uh, do you want to always use the same hasher so the iteration order will be deterministic? I don't think that's why I did it. I'm trying to, actually, there might be a PR. Let me check here uh, what we got here. I'm pretty sure there was a PR that did this change. Um, mm, 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 mm. Maybe I just push, let's do hasher and see what we get here. Commits. Uh, no. It's a very good question. I don't actually know why. I don't know why that's there. Actually, I suppose we can look at, um, we can look at EV map right apply. So this is given the hasher. Why is it given the hasher? Yeah, it just passes in the hasher everywhere. You know, I honestly have no idea. I guess let's go back and blame. I'm going to do a little tour of Git here while we're at it. Um, so let's go ahead and look at source right uh, blame. Let's go ahead here and look at, ooh, that's not at all what I wanted to do. Let's undo that. Um, R hasher. Wow, what an innocuous commit name. Stress test duplicates plus fix. I mean, I'm guessing some test failed, but don't know why. Yeah, this is certainly where I introduced that change. The drain must have been determined, must have a deterministic iteration order. 
Well, I guess here's the comment. Um, let me just go to that one. Where's the file, this file? Oh, that's real subtle. All right, let me find that actual comment here. Okay, so this is actually in the values. So this is um, in the hash bag of values in EVMAP when it uses maps. Um, because otherwise, okay, I'll, I'll let you read this because it actually explains what the problem is. Basically, um, if the iteration order is not consistent, you might end up with uh, a rem uh, swap remove, for example, being applied to two different um, to two different sides of the map. Um, you might end up with swap removes being applied in different orders by the different sides of the map, which means that they end up uh, dropping and forgetting different elements from one another, and you end up double dropping as opposed to forgetting and dropping. Um, I'll leave this up for a second so you can read it while I catch up with chat. Um, this is very specific to the value sets. Um, So it's a good question whether we actually, whether this, this is something we have to preserve. Now that said, this change just always gave, gave the hasher of the thing on the right. So, so in theory, if we just give a reference to whatever is currently well, it's not the thing on the right, but the read handle. Um, so in theory, if we just always give in a pointer to the read handle, that should have the same effect. Um, I'm just trying to see here whether... I see, it makes sure to use the same hasher in all of the like nested hash bags and stuff. I think that's actually the primary, that's really what makes a difference here. It's just making sure that everything is using the same hasher. That's what's going on. So it's not that it's actually using the hasher each time, it's that if it happens to create a new like bag hash bag for the values, it makes sure to use the same hasher as it uses for the, the map as a whole. Uh, and as long as all of the hashers in the system are sort of the same, uh, this ends up not being a problem. I see. So in that case, giving a reference to either left or right should be fine because they they always end up yielding the, uh, they all end up using the same hasher. All right, sorry, that was me trying to work through what was going on while trying to explain it. So let me take one step back um, and try to actually explain what went wrong. Okay, so, um, Remember, we need to make sure that every operation from the op log is applied deterministically. This means that if you have um, if you have the values be, for example, a hash map or something, or a hash bag in this case, um, the iteration order of that bag also has to be deterministic. That is, it has to be the same whether you're doing it to the hash bag when it's in the left or the hash bag when it's in the right for some given key. Um, if they use different hashers, it won't be. And so we need to make sure that anything in the val anything in the uh, anything in the, the type that we're creating the left right over has to be deterministic, which means that if it uses a hasher, it has to use the same hasher. Um, but in order to do that, we need to 
pass the hasher around so that if we ever say create a new hash bag because someone inserts a key for the first time, we need to create a hash bag. We need to make sure that we create it with the same hasher as it's used everywhere else. Um, and so that's why this hasher is being passed everywhere. Now, because the hasher is the same in the left and the right map, because they're clones of each other to begin with, um, because that's the case, um, it's, um, well, yeah, because the, because the initial two maps are clones of each other, their hashers are initially initial, uh, the same. So it doesn't matter which one we give a reference to, to get to the hasher because their hashers are the same. So if you clone the hasher, you'll get the same hash regardless of whether you took it from left or right. Um, so ultimately, all that matters here is that it, it needs this, this shared reference in order to ensure that uh, any determinist, any non-determinism, any source of non-determinism, like the hasher of the hash map, is actually cloned throughout the system so they also use the same source of non-determinism, i.e. the same hasher. Uh, and so giving a reference to the the T on the other side, as opposed to specifically the hasher, should be sufficient. Uh, great, so our handle here should be enough. Uh, 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 uh. There's a bunch of reference to maps in the comments as something we can uh, clean up later, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have meta information anymore. What I'm imagining is that modifications to the meta can be part of the op log. And that way it's up to the implementation to make sure that it keeps that as an internal field somewhere. Uh, notice also that there's the scope here. That's what causes the R handle to go out of scope so that we make sure that at the time when we swap, we no longer have that reference in there. Uh, do you even need the R handle if you pass the W handle anyway? Probably not. Um, the implementation could probably just use the hasher from the W handle instead. At the same time, I don't think there's really a downside to passing in the R handle here. Um, I, it keeps the trait simpler, but I'm just like, I'm just paranoid that in the future, someone will be like, oh, but I need access to the other one to something, something. So I feel like we, given that we can trivially get at it, we might as well just provide it, is my thinking. Um... Yeah, so the comment here, right, at this point, we have exclusive access to W handle and it's up to date with all rights. The stale R handle is accessed by readers through an R clone of the atomic pointer inside read handle and op log contains all the changes that are in W handle, but not in R handle. And so now we can do the swap. Uh, so this is just actually doing the swap. Um, it, after, so it does the swap here. That's the atomic pointer swap. Um, then as a fence to make sure for memory ordering reasons, we want to make sure that we read the epoch counters strictly after we did the swap. Otherwise, the CPU is allowed to reorder these instructions, and that, that's not okay. So this is the step where we read the epochs at the end of refresh, right? As I talked about in the beginning. Um, yeah, and as the note says at this point, there's likely still readers using the W handle because they haven't left yet. Uh, and second and first are optimizations we no longer care about. Um, so flush is a, an operation that's a conditional refresh. So it only does a refresh if there are things to refresh. Uh, set metadata goes away, but add op is going to be append op. That's going to be an O. Uh, and we don't have this first optimization anymore, so we're just going to do this. That's all append op is going to be. And all these methods that are specific to maps are now going to go away. Um, we do have to figure out what to do about clear. I don't quite know what to do about clear yet, uh, which we I think we need for drop. Uh, fit, fit all, reserve, empty, random, uh, apply first. So apply first and apply second 
um, are methods that are going to be on the T itself. So if we go back up here, this is not going to be self apply second. This is actually going to be W handle dot apply second and W handle dot apply first. Uh, which means that the actual methods down here, uh, and I guess we can go back and add these to the documentation over there. Um, all of this, like what you do for each operation, that's all going to end up in um, in the actual implementation of absorb for map that EVMAP is going to end up using. Same with extend. Uh, there's no reason for us to implement extend here because extend is a map specific thing. Um, we do probably want to implement deref for right handle uh, so that you can easily access whatever the inner type is through the right handle. Um, here, we only need to implement, this is where it's like, it's kind of silly for us to have this requirement it just for deref, given that it's not a requirement it's not actually a requirement, but we need it because it's on the struct and it's on the struct because we need it for drop. Um, there we go. Uh, and these tests, uh, I guess we'll port over later. Uh, it seems like the requirements for implementing absorb are gonna be very subtle. Um, yeah, I think absorb is a very subtle trait, and it could really be that um, it could really be that this needs to be an unsafe trait. I think you're right, um, which is like this is already in an unsafe block. I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, uh, could you elaborate a bit more on what the problem with clear is? Yeah, so uh, let me go back here up to draw. Okay, so in drop, what we're first gonna do is synchronize the two maps so that they have the exact same contents. Um, and then what we wanna do is we wanna drop both maps. Um, but we don't really have a good way of dropping both maps because in the first map, we want to forget all the values. In the second map, we wanna drop all the values but we don't have a way to say forget all the values, right? If we drop it, they get freed. Um, we could just forget the whole T, but that doesn't seem right. We actually do need to drop the T because there might be allocations in there, like the allocation of the, the buckets for the hash map, for example. So we can't just forget the whole T. We need to sort of clear the T. We need to make the that make one of the two Ts be emptied by forgetting but still dropping things that need to be dropped. And the other T is the one we're actually okay with just dropping. But that means that there has to be an operation that's like clear this while taking into account the fact that you're, um, while taking into account the fact that you are uh, actually not allowed to drop. Um, so, I think maybe what we want here is for this to be a method on absorb. So this has to be like a, maybe it should actually just be forget. So this is, uh, um, Maybe drop forget or drop first, actually. Uh, so this is uh, drop self, but do not deallocate any shared values. Do not, I guess, drop any shared values. So this will be drop first. Did that make sense? Um, all right, I'm sure there's still errors in this file. 
uh, but I don't immediately see them. So let's switch over now to read handle. Um, so for read, we have a bunch of, uh, actually, let me show you here. Oop. Uh, source. Uh, we can remove shallow copy. We're not going to need that here. Um, and read, let's also go ahead and move read mod rs to just be source read.rs because that's nicer to work with. Oops, that's not at all what I wanted to do. Uh, EV map source read mod to source read rs. Um, so there's read rs and then there's also a a sort of subdirectory for read, uh, and that includes some some handy helper methods. So, uh, a read handle you can't just deref into the the T because it needs to also make sure to update the um, um, update the epic counters appropriately. So this is why I have a read guard type. This is similar to mutex. So the idea is that when you have a read handle, you can sort of take the guard. You think of it as calling lock, except you're not actually locking anything. Um, that gives you back a guard. The guard dereferences into the T, and then when you drop the guard, it increments the epic again. Um, so that's guard. And uh, factory is, um, you might want to be able to clone new read handles without actually storing a read handle. Um, this might be because the read handle, for example, is not sync. Um, we'll look at that in a second why, why that is. Um, but imagine that you you want to store like a lacy static or like a just like a completely shared arc that people can grab new read handles from. You don't want that thing to be a read handle because it would it would have it would require that the read handle type itself was like send and sync and all that stuff, which it is not. Um, so that's why we have the read the read handle factory type, which is a sort of a, a stripped down version of read handle that only allows you to create read handles. It doesn't actually have its own epic. Um, and read ref is uh, kind of uninteresting now that we're not dealing with maps. Um, so I can get rid of that. Uh, Actually, let's look at readref first. Why is that there, I wonder? Mm. Yeah, so this just implements like map methods around guard. I don't know why these are not implemented directly on guard, I forget. I think it's because of the iterator trait, actually. Um, so, but we don't need those anymore here. That's a type that would be provided by the implementer of absorb. So we can get rid of read ref. Um, we do need to look at read.rs. Let's start with that one. Uh, there's no longer an inner and there's no longer a values. Uh, we no longer have random state or hashers. Um, there is no longer a read ref. Uh, this documentation goes away. Read handle now just also takes a T and an O, but it does not actually know, need to know about absorb at all. In fact, it doesn't even need to know about O, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think read has to know about O. That's kind of neat. Ah, read handle. Right, because the read handle never sees the op log. Nice. Um, it just has an atomic pointer to a T, right? Just like the right side has a, a handle to a T and the read side has a, a sort of atomic pointer to a T. Um, it has epics, it has a, um, it has sort of a, a a shared epic counter for itself. So it's shared between, the reason it's an arc, right, is it's shared between itself and the right handle. Um, epic i is just like a local cache of the epic, I think. And my epic, I forget why exists, but I guess we'll find out later. Uh, 
Um, right. Okay. So this part is a little weird. Um, so read handle takes a um, read handle takes an immutable reference to self uh, in order to do in order like it has to implement deref right and deref well actually it doesn't have to implement deref but the call to get a guard take currently just takes an immutable reference to self to the read handle but under the hood, it's not really an immutable reference because it needs to update the epic guard. So it should sort of be a mutable reference to self. It just feels weird for a read hand, like a read operation to require mute self. Um, but I think this is actually something we want to change. It's sort of a, an oddity of how it currently works. Uh, so I think we're going to tidy this up a little bit. Uh, this is so, okay, this is kind of funky. The reason that it, I've implemented not sync this way is because um, at least it used to be that, uh, and this might still be the case that there's a, you need to like use a nightly feature in order to specifically implement not sync. So instead I just inserted a type that is not sync. Um, wah -wah. Um, this might actually, ch making this change might mean that we don't know, that we no longer need the read factory. So we're going to switch this around a little. Um, this is in fact a U size. This is the index into epics that belongs to us. So the index in epics that uh, is equal to this. And then my epic is sort of a cache of what our epic was. That wasn't atomic because we wanted to be able to take um, an immutable reference to self. If we're going to change that now, that can change, which is nice. Um, this now just takes T, doesn't have to take any bounds. So the reason we need to implement drop for read handle, uh, is because we have to make sure that, uh, parity must be restored is not quite right here, but we want to remove our own, well, we want to remove our own epic counter from the sort of master epic counter list. Um, and we need to do that so that, uh, so that we don't have the writer just continuously look at all these epics that are just no longer relevant. Um, oh, I think what I mean here is that, uh, epic must already be even, uh, for us to have at mute self. Uh, so okay to lock since we're not holding up the epic anyway. Um, yeah, so the drop here is just removing ourselves from the, the global list. Uh, we can implement debug. Oh, it's so nice to get rid of all these bounds. Uh, although we do, and we don't have any bounds actually for debug for read handle because it's really just printing out integers. Um, because remember the read handle, until you sort of lock it, like unless you, until you increment your epic, you can't actually read through the read handle. You must implement the epic first. So if you wanted to just debug a read handle, all you can do is print out information about the epics. Uh, cloning a read handle is really just creating a new read handle. So this should be fine. Uh, and the fact that you can clone a read, ha read handle now and the read handle is sync means we no longer need the factory. Uh, so let me go ahead and remove the factory entirely. Uh, and source read factory. Um, because now you can just stick the read handle in a, in an arc if you wanted to clone it. It does mean that there's technically an additional epic for the writer to, to use, but it's unlikely that you had many factories anyway. Uh, all right, uh, creating a new read handle really just requires that you give me a T and an epics. And it again, just boxes the, the T 
uh, stores the pointer in an atomic pointer that is a, a that is reference counted so that it can be shared among all the readers. Um, and the, the, the distinction between the outer function and the inner function here is not clear it's a good one, really. I feel like it would be nicer to just have this be pub create new, probably. Right? Isn't that just better? That's definitely better. Let's do that instead. Much nicer. We don't need this extra freestanding new function. That seems silly. Um, great. We no longer have this thing. And my epic is going to start out at zero. I forget why it caches my epic. I guess we'll find out soon. Um, uh, factory goes away. Oh, I love just getting rid of all this stuff that used to be there. Uh, we no longer have any requirements on T. OK, so handle here is the one that used to be um, used to take just a reference to self. That's now going to take mute self. Um, hasher is going to go away. Right. Uh, these are going to go away. These are just like uh, convenience methods for take the lock and then call this method on map. Um, those can all go away now. Makes me very happy, very, very happy, very, very, very happy. Uh, is destroyed. So destroy is um, if the right handle goes away, then then it takes both maps with it. So reads need to start returning like none, uh, and that's what is destroyed does. Uh, contains key is a map method. Contains value is a map method. Uh, map into is a map method. Nice. And all the tests can go away for now. Um, we don't really need read to be different from handle. I don't know what the best name for this method is. Um, of the T. Uh, T can be refresh or T has been destroyed. This function returns none. Um, maybe read is the right method, right? This is sort of like lock, except it's not really lock. Um, so this is going to be a read guard of the lifetime here is uh, the type lifetime of self. Um, right. So here's what we're going to do. We're actually just going to steal this whole implementation. We don't need this to be multiple methods anymore. Um, so we're going to go over here and steal that over here. Uh, does that new change you made just break the clone impl? Oh, it probably did. Oh, that's why. That's real dumb. I guess that's why it was there. Um, uh, new with arc, which takes a uh, arc atomic pointer of t. Fine, fine, fine. It's I still think it's better for it to be on here. So we're gonna. It is a change, but uh, so that's gonna call self. Uh, new with arc uh, inner x. And this is not going to be public. Uh, 
Uh, and then clone has to call new with arc. Um, great. I think read is a decent name for this. It is a little weird to have a read handle that you call read on in order to get a read guard that you can read from. Like there's a lot of read, um, but I really don't want to call it lock because it makes it sound like you're locking something when you're not. Um, it could be guard, but like read is pretty appropriate. Like I want to do a read. It could be start read um, or like use or it could be enter. Enter is not bad. Enter is not bad. Borrow, also not bad, but not technically accurate. Um, yeah, I like enter. Enter is good. Uh, all right. There's a bunch of comments here. That's fine. Um, I honestly don't know why my epic is stored separately because we could just update self.epic directly. Uh, let ep, uh, That epic is self dot. Yeah, I honestly don't remember, but I'm not going to change it now. Uh, epic plus equals one. Yeah, so this is where you see we first update the epic counter. Um, and then we do a fence to make sure it doesn't get reordered to after the swap um, or to after the, the read of the pointer. Then we read the atomic value. Uh, and at that point, because you can think of like increment of the counter sort of locked the data structure, we know it won't change under us now. Um, and so now it's safe for us to, to do this. Um, this might be none if the pointer is, uh, if the pointer is null um, because the writer has destroyed it, ooh, has not yet been initialized. Why would that be the case? This sounds like a case I didn't deal with. Um, I don't think that can happen. This map has not yet been initialized. I think this has to do with the, the first optimization. But like the I think the idea here was that until you call refresh the first time, uh, you can't read anything from the map. I think is the intention. But I don't think that's the distinction we want to make here. But it can be null. Um, it can be null if we read after the right handle removed it. But at that point, it doesn't matter whether we restore parity. Hmm. So this is going to be old epic or previous epic to be very explicit about it. Uh, the map has been destroyed, so restore parity. And so this is going to be. No, I think this really is let. 
fetch add returns the value before the add, right? So something's wonky here. Let me check this in read mod, just what this used to do. Epic was set to the old epic. So old epic plus one does not, res oh, and then it sets the bit, I see. I don't know why I did this, why I ended up using the high bit instead of even odd. It's a good question. Also probably something someone can submit a PR to fix. I, I want to avoid changing as much of the concurrency primitive as I can, um, both just to show that it's possible, but also because it means that if things go wrong, they're probably because of the change we made and not changes to the concurrency algorithm. Um, So I guess this is previous, nope, I'm in the wrong file. Um, so this is gonna be previous epic plus one. But if I'm using previous epic plus one everywhere, then why don't I just store the epic? That epic is self dot my epic, great. Uh, and then this is going to store the epic. Oh, epic doesn't look like a word anymore. Uh, oh, this uses the old epic. Oh my, why? Okay, so this means that the guard now uh, is going to be off by one everywhere. Yeah, so this needs to not be a plus one anymore. And I think that's the only place it was used. Okay, great. Um, and this is also just gonna be epic and set the high bit. Um, I don't think I want this if no refresh has happened to return none. Guys, I think that should be up to the T whether or not the value is valid before the first refresh. If the T has been destroyed, this function returns none. Um, yep. To me, it sounds like you're saying epic, yeah. I mean, it's ep epoch. Epoch is a different way to say it, but I think epic is also a, a valid pronunciation. Uh, everywhere in read handle and read guard, you need to swap u size. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this, I already did it, I think. Um, epic i should remain u size because it's an index into the epic slab, uh, so it should be a u size. Um, but if there is another, uh, this needs to be u64, and this needs to be u64, and I guess in guard, uh, this needs to be u64, this needs to be u64, u64, u64. Um, left, right. Uh, there's no longer values in here. Uh, T being read cannot change. If runner attempts to call right and refresh, that call will block until this guard is dropped. Um, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, so you notice that guard has some like handy mapping methods. This is the same thing that you see on something like, um, if you use ref cell, 
uh, or in fact, I think mutex guards as well. Um, you can map, like if you have a mutex guard to a T, you can call map on it to map to an, a value that's inside of the T. So you get a map guard like U where U is like a field of T or something, um, but you, re you retain the guard. And this, this is sometimes handy if you want to pass a reference to something that's inside of a guard you're holding to some subfunction without giving it a handle to the whole outer thing. Um, uh, and you see that for read guard, we can actually implement asref t, uh, deref to t, uh, the drop we already looked at, into iterator, we will not implement for read guard. All right, nice. Um, there's a bunch of types here now that we don't use, like all of these guys, that's nice. Let's see if this compiles, probably doesn't. Um, <laughs> this has been an epic journey. That's funny. Uh, is there a way to pass in the field into size of instead of the type name? So the changes to the type and the start automatically changes what size of a value it's to. Yeah, there is. Um, so you can do, um, I think it's just size of val. Let me look this up. I think it's size of val, uh, where you give a reference to t. Yeah. There's also size of val. Uh, size of val raw. I don't know what size of val raw does. Oh, it's just a raw pointer. Yes, yeah, so we can do size of val um, of like self dot my epic. Um, although we would also need to deal with this guy, which is a little more annoying. So I think I'm gonna keep it this way for now. Um, it's a little annoying that I had specifically, actually this might just not compile. So if I do uh, if I do this and just do if I did one like u32, what would this say? Um, I'm just gonna leave this for myself to see whether this stops compiling. Because if this can just be an untyped one and it gets coerced into the right type, that would certainly be nicer. Um, all right, we've got some remaining things that are weird here. Uh, so read handle factory went away. That's nice. Uh, read handle does not have an O. That's also nice. This should be read read handle new, which I guess means that this should be right handle new. And since we're exporting the type, it can just be this, uh, which means that here we probably have a freestanding new function which should really just be a function on right handle. Uh, that returns a self. Uh, like so. All right, what else is it complaining about? Uh, on right line 28. Um, ooh. All right. Have to pass it everywhere now. It's very sad. I wish it wasn't needed for drop, but it kind of is. Um, okay, so it does actually complain about U64 ORD with U32. So that suggests that if I just make this one, Okay, yeah, then I, I totally agree with you. This should be, um, so this would be in read guard. That should be a one and size of val of, we just have to be careful here that we're not giving a reference to a reference because then we'd end up with the size of u size. Um, so this should be self dot, let me just make sure this is in fact true. Yeah, size of, Val self, uh, and same in right. 
this then should be, so here it's a little trickier because we don't have something with that type. Um, but we might be able to get something. Uh, we can't use any, we can use last epics actually. Uh, so what we can do is say, um, epic type is self last epics get zero unwrap or zero. Uh, we need to unwrap or because last epics might be empty. And then we can do size of val of epic type. And we can do um, uh, actually, <laughs> this is real, really annoying, but we're going to do this map to one. Uh, Yeah, map to one, unwrap or one. And then this is going to be epic type. So I guess epic unit is a better name. So this is a little bit of an ugly hack, but the idea is that we want something that has the same type as the epics. And the way we do that is we just get something that is an epic, um, but we need it to be a one so that we can have it be unit and shift it appropriately. So we map whatever value you get out to one, and we also need to unwrap or in case there are no epics in last epics, uh, but this will ultimately get us a one in the correct type uh, as long as last epics is of echo view 64s, which it is. A little bit of a hack, but it works. That map doesn't care about its input. You're right. Uh, you're right, that won't work because the map here is going to generate an i32. Good catch. So we're going to... Uh, <laughs> well, we could do operations on X, but actually Here's what we're going to do instead. We're going to do unwrap or, then we're going to do epic unit is one. Uh, what? Ugh, copied, fine. Because it get returns an option that's a reference. It's a, an option reference into epics. Um, this is going to complain with uh, value read but not used, and then we can just allow uh, whatever that lint is. So that lint is going to be up here. Uh, I guess the lint is going to come eventually. That way we avoid doing like ugly, unnecessary ar arithmetic. So for example, if we did e minus e, like uh, map e, e minus e plus one, um, we could do that, but it, that seems even hackier. XOR with zero would also work, I guess, but. I think Clippy might complain about that too, because it's like a useless operation. The compiler might not complain, but Clippy will probably complain. Uh, whereas if here we're being very explicit that we're doing this just to get the type. Uh, all right, what else we got? 138. Um, this needs to be enter. Line 60. Uh, this is an atomic U64. I love the compiler. Thanks for telling me all the ways I'm, in which I'm wrong, compiler. It's very helpful. Uh, right to 31. Uh, this is going to be a manually drop new. Mm. 
This is going to be DRAF. All right, this is going to be as starting with T. Our, so what we're using here, right, is uh, we have the value in the right handle is in manually drop because it wouldn't be safe for us to just drop it. Um, so we could alternatively have the value in the read side be manually drop. That might be better. They're sort of equivalent. Like it, if you're mostly doing inserts, there'll be more things in the right handle. If you're most, if you're doing a bunch of deletes, there'll be more things in the read handle. I think they're they're basically equivalent. Um, so manually drop uh, where this gets tricky, right? Is here we have the W handle and we want to get at the inner type. We we the because the R handle is a box T or an atomic pointer T, um, and the W handle is a, a pointer to a manually drop T. That's why we have to do the cast. Um, I think there's a nicer way to do this, but I forget. Yeah, we could deref, um, but this seems fine to do as a cast anyway. Uh, Uh, that's fine. This can just be uh, R handle as mute manually drop T. All right, what else we got? Um, Actually, this is another good point. Um, this logic of we're only going to drop things once would be sort of broken if someone passed us a T that had items in it already, because those items would presumably not be aliased. I guess it would be, yeah. So, so um, to explain that <laughs> in a little bit more of a sane way. So we have our constructor for the left right here, right? It takes a single T. It clones the T and makes one thing the right half and one thing the read half. But by cloning it, we mean, that means that both the two halves own their values. If Imagine that they're non-empty, like the, the caller provided some values in the T initially. So if they did that, um, then those values will be owned on both sides and actually need to be dropped on both sides to free the memory. But from, from the point they give it to left, right, and forward, um, we're only ever going to drop one of them because we're going to assume that they're aliased. Uh, so, but I think this is something we're going to leave to the caller to figure out. There's no unsafety here. It's just uh, it might end up with a memory leak if, they, uh, if the T is non-empty. Uh, no, if T is non-empty, um, uh, values may not be dropped unless you handle them specifically in apply first. Unless you drop the in, unless you specifically drop the initial values in apply first. This just like smells a lot like a foot gun. So there's an argument here for we should only provide a new that um, does debug, uh, does that uses default. So it also always starts out empty. Um, you could require that for this new T approach, you have T implements shallow clone. Um, so T itself should not be a shallow clone or a shallow copy because then you would end up with both both halves pointing to the same map, which is not what we want. That's what shallow copy would do. Um, so I think one argument here is we make new unsafe. It's not really unsafe. Like it's not memory unsafe. So it's not, it feels like not really the right thing to do. Um, 
But this also seems like a big foot gun. Um, mm, yeah, I think... Um, I think we really just want this to require default. Um, and then I think we want to create a T default here and a T default here. It's just gonna lead to much less pain. Oh, we could have a new trait that's like um, an initial shallow clone, but I think we should just go this way instead. Um, all right, what do we have left? No method inner. Um, no method inner. Oh, this should just be inner. It's not a method. Um, Ah. Mm. So here, manually drop, I think, does not implement DRF mute. It only implements DRF. Not entirely sure why that is, actually. Um, no, it does implement DRF mute. So, ah, but it doesn't forward the absorb trait. Um, so here, the one, there are two things we could do. So uh, let me explain why this happens. So if you have um, some type that implements absorb, and then you wrap that type in say a box or a manually drop or some type that implements DREF mute, um, that trait will not be implemented for the wrapper type. The reason you can use a trait like um, clone or equality or something through box is because um, is because box specifically forwards traits that it knows about. So if we read down into box, um, you'll see down here that it implements clone for box T where T is clone. It implements default for box T where T is default. It implements um, eek for box T where T is eek. So it forwards all these traits, but box doesn't know about absorb. So box won't forward the absorb trait sort of through it. Um, and same thing with something like manually drop. Now, there are two ways we can fix this. Uh, one is that we can have blanket implementations here. So we could do impl o um, impl uh, t o absorb o for t for um, mute t, where t implements absorb. Um, and then just have all the methods forward. Uh, and then do this, we could even do the same for like, have a blanket implementation for box t, a blanket implementation for um, manually drop t. Uh, this gets pretty tedious but it will make absor the absorb type a little nicer to work with. Um, like imagine that someone ha implements um, absorb for hash map, but then they pass in like a manually drop hash map or they pass in a mutable reference to, to hash map. That wouldn't work in our current scenario because those types, the, those pointer types do not implement uh, the trait. Um, but it does lead to a lot of duplication, which is pretty annoying. Um, in fact, But it does mean that we have to enumerate all of these. Um, the alternative is that here we can just like deref it through the, the manually drop like this. Um, and then apply second will be the specifically the T. Uh, am I being stupid? Probably am. Huh? Don't we require that T is absorbed? No method apply second found from, oh, we need to use the trait. We already used the trait. 
Alright, so the other way we can go is absorb. Explicitly say that that's the thing we want to do. Uh, w handle. Uh, no function apply second. Is it not called? Oh, it's called absorb. Fine. <laughs> absorb second. Actually, maybe this is just. Maybe the deref will actually handle this. Uh, w handle, yeah, it probably will. Um, it'll deref first and then realize that the deref implements the trait. Um, the problem still holds here though, where actually here they're gonna specifically, yeah, so imagine that someone writes like, uh, like left, right, new, I guess this would be like left, right, new, uh, and they try to give the type, say, um, box hash map kv, and some operational type. Um, now, if they did that, then, and let's say absorb was implemented for this type, absorb would not be implemented for the type they're trying to pass in because box does not forward absorb. And they can't implement um, absorb for box because this is the the sort of coherence rules for traits that a third party crate, you can only implement traits for types if you own either the trait or the type. In this case, they don't own the absorb trait, we do, and they don't own the box type, the standard library does. Um, so we actually do need to provide these implementations. There's a separate discussion here for why is O uh, a, a, an associated type? Why is O not an associated type? Why is it a generic parameter of the trait? Uh, we can go into that in a second. I do want to simplify this a little bit though by uh, writing a little macro. Uh, and the macro is going to be forward. Um, and it's really just going to take a T, which is a type. I forget it's tip. I can never remember what the actual thing is here. Um, and it's going to do this uh, for this may just have to be a path um, because a T would include the generic parameters. Um, and then we're just going to have that implement all the methods. Um, and in all cases, it's really just going to rely on the fact that the type derefs um, to call self, absorb first, operation another. Absorb second, and self.drop first. Um, we might be able to, yeah, so someone pointed out, you can maybe implement like absorb for you where you implement deref mute. Um, I don't think we can do that because uh, that, if you, I guess the proposal is implement like T O U um, absorb O for some U where U implements deref mute um, T and T implements absorb O um, and just have the forwarding be here. Um, but if we did that, this is a blanket implementation for U. So this means that no one else could implement the absorb trait for their own types. Um, because the compiler would say, well, this overlaps with this implementation. Even, even though we have a where bound here, um, this would be fixed, I think, with specialization. But specialization hasn't landed yet, so let's not rely on it. Um, did I write a borb somewhere? A borb? Because if so, that's hilarious. Um, I think it's just tie. Yeah, it might just be tie. Oh, but also it has to be colon path. Uh, what, is it, what is it complaining about? 
Oh, unused macro, that's fine. So we're gonna forward through uh, box and some other types later. Actually, here's what we're gonna have to do. Well, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Um, yeah, so actually I may have to do it now. Uh, I think what this is gonna end up looking like is this. Um, and this is gonna be a tie. This is gonna be a... Uh, macro book. Little book of Rust macros. I love this thing. Um, macro rules. All right, show me what the different captures are. Uh, I think it's ident or tt are probably going to work, both going to work. So this is going to be t. Oh, there's a borb. I found it. Uh, and this is going to be, ugh, this is going to be through. Where T. Um, so many absorbs. Um, and this should be absorb of O. I guess unsafe impl. That's fine. Uh, and this obviously is going to have to uh, do a deref mute. The whole point of these types is that they deref into the necessary type. Um, wait, why can't this? first why can't this do without recursing that seems like a lie right okay fine yeah because it's taking a mutable reference to self fine 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 Okay, and this is going to be absorb uh, second, and this is going to be absorb drop first. All right, so this now can forward t. Uh, the, the, the reason that the t needs to be explicitly passed in here is because of uh, macro hygiene. So you can't talk about a type, you can't talk about any identifier inside of a macro that exists outside of the macro. Um, and, and vice versa. So if we said like, uh, if we had this be just a capital T, then the thing that gets passed in the second argument couldn't also use T. Those would just be completely separate T's. So we needed to pass in the T so that we can name the T in the type. Uh, and now we can do like mute T, we can forward to um, like arc T, uh, we can forward through uh, manually drop T. Uh, what else might we want? I think realistically, um, like what, what would be people actually want to pass in here is the real question. Like, Mute T isn't going to implement default. Um, arc T, I have a hard time thinking that anyone's going to stick an arc T in here. To be honest, I have a hard time people are going to stick box T in here too, but it's not impossible. But an arc T doesn't make sense because they're not going to be able to share this type regardless. Um, manually drop, maybe they would pass in, but it seems weird for both of these to be manually dropped. So for now, I think we're just going to forward box. Um, a borb is literally everywhere. <laughs> Chad really got obsessed with a borb. 
I'm trying to trying to save you from all the aborbs, you know? They're out to get you. Um, we could explicitly call deref mute. Um, that's the other thing. So we could, but we would have to use the trait. You have to write like use uh, ops deref mute or borrow. I forget where there's ops and then call self dot deref mute. Um, but this is the more concise way to do it. Um, we could use. Oh, that's a good point. We could use T absorb first self, maybe. That's a five. Yeah, that's nicer. Um, so this way, the deref, the asref actually uh, is probably going to be used here to coerce this into a mutable reference to the inner type. Um, this won't work with deref mute. This will only work work with as mute, I think. Um, whereas this one will actually use work with uh, deref mute. Um, I don't know if this is nicer, but I think it's probably fine. Given that we control the impl anyway, this is a little nicer. Uh, oh, you're right. Our arc doesn't implement deref mute anyway. Uh, Uh, arc and RC, uh, no, arc and RC do not deref mute, so they don't make sense here. Um, abort the aborb. Um, I think box is really the only one I can think of where someone might want the left and right types to be box types. I don't think it makes sense for them to be arc types, because they shouldn't be shared. Um, I don't think it makes sense for them to be manually dropped. Um, yeah, no, I think box is the only one I can really think of. Box is sort of special. Um, uh, yeah, my plan is to, to switch EVMAP to use left, right in the stream as well. Do you expect there to be crates that expose specific common collections through left, right? Maybe, maybe all of them exist in EVMAP. I don't know yet. Um, but uh, I, I certainly know there's a lot of appetite for a single value version of EVMAP, so one that doesn't have a value set, uh, and this change will enable that. All right, what else we got? Read. Uh, 138. Right, is, so, okay, this is where it gets a little weird. Right. Um, so this is on read handle. So remember how read handle enter takes a mutable reference to self. Well, read handle used to have this method that's like is destroyed, and is destroyed used to just take an immutable reference to self, which makes a lot of sense. Like you're not you're just checking whether it's destroyed. In reality, though, uh, it calls enter, which in turn needs to do all the weird work to like take the epic counter and stuff. But I think we can actually optimize is destroyed um, because I think all it needs to do is check whether the R handle is null. So I think we can actually just do this. Nice. Much, much nicer. Because because we're not dereferencing the value, we don't need to increment the epic, right? To, to tell the writer that we're like consuming the pointer or anything. All we're doing is loading it and seeing if it's null. If so, it's been destroyed. That's nice. I like that. So that one can stay immutable reference to self. Um, all right, what else we got here? Why is map ref and map opt? Why are they pub super and not just pub? I think they should just be pub. I'm not sure why this has a map option. That seems excessive.
Like, why is, first of all, this should just be called map. Um, and this should, because, so in general, this is another observation. So read guard uh, deref's into the inner type. So imagine that the that the type T also had a map function. Uh, that's really awkward because now when you call dot map, you're going to get the read guard dot map, not the T dot map. Um, and this is the same problem that arc has, for example, with clone, where if the inner type implements clone and you call clone on the arc, it's not immediately obvious whether you get a clone of the arc or the clone of the inner T. Um, and this is why for arc clone, for example, the recommendation is that you never write like my arc dot clone, you always write arc clone uh, my arc to indicate specifically that you're looking to clone the arc and not the inner type. Uh, and I think we want the same thing for read guard. This is the same thing if you look at uh, ref mute has a map method and that similarly is not a method, but it's a function that takes like this, which is a self. Uh, so that way, this is not an inherent method on self. It's not something you can use dot for. You would have to write read guard colon colon map. Um, I don't know why we have map opt here. Is map opt really that different? Let's look at what um, ref mute, which is the thing you get back from ref cell does. So ref mute has a map. Um, it has a map split and it has a leak. Uh, why is map split okay? Oh, I see. I don't care about map split yet. Map is good enough. Yeah, and notice that map here does not take a self, right? It takes an orig. I guess we can use the same naming here um, so that it's not an inherent method. And I think we're just gonna get rid of map opt. Ah, what did I do? Great. Uh, does is destroyed make sense if it returns false? Since it could also be always be destroyed right after. Yeah, I mean, is droid destroyed is sort of a, um, you can think of it more as like an optimistic operation, like, Tell me if it currently is. This is the same thing as um, on arc. There's a um, like, um, give me the current number of um, reference, like give me the current reference count, which is also a useless method because the reference count is like, it might be changing. Someone might be cloning it right now. Um, but sometimes it's useful to have access to the information, even if it's sort of approximate. It might be that there are other invariants in your program that make it so that that approximate information you know is precise. An example of this is uh, if the if you are told that the reference count is currently one, then you know that it won't change because the only reference is the one that you have that you called reference count on to get one. Um, I don't know whether the same applies to is destroyed, but it's a cheap operation for us to provide and the caller can't get it any other. Well, they could call enter, but there's a much cheaper way to giving it. Um, do you have a benchmark for EV map? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a benchmark for EV map in, um, uh, in the repository. We can run it. I haven't, I don't know if I've run it on this computer before, so I don't know if I really have representative results. Um, this abstraction layer shouldn't matter because of monomorphization. Uh, the code should end up being the same. The only place where it will be different is um, uh, Rust generally doesn't inline across crate boundaries unless you explicitly mark a method as being inlineable. Um, so that might be a small difference, but my guess is it doesn't really matter. Um, this map business means you can't use method syntax. Maybe just use a different name. So this is the reason why the standard library does it this way and doesn't do self is because no matter what name you choose here, it might be that the T has the same type. Um, and so it's always better to provide this as a um, class method or a type method uh, as opposed to a... Um, as opposed to an inherent method. It's true, you can't use method syntax, but that's sort of the point. 
Mm, all right, what do we have? Right, so this is the, um, the error we expected to get, right? Which is we had a warning here saying that this is an unused assignment. And we want to allow that specifically. On assignments. We want uh, a one in the type of the epoch, epochs without naming that type here. Uh, Rust does inline across, inline across crate boundaries with LTO, uh, but LTO is a little bit more of a pain to compile, like it's generally slower. You can use thin LTO, um, which gets most of the benefit of LTO without completely killing your build times. Um, and I think that does inlining across crate boundaries, but it's off by default. Um, nice. So I think that now compiles. That's cool. So we now have this, this left-right type. Um, and now what we need to figure out is whether we can implement EV map in terms of this type. There's obviously a bunch of documentation that's missing here that we need to fill out. Um, but we now at least seem to have the concurrency primitive uh, isolated. And then what's going to sort of be the big test is whether EV map can be implemented in terms of this. Um, maybe we run into some weird problems with generics. I don't think we will, uh, but we're going to find out. All right, I'm going to take a quick bio break and I'll be back. Just uh, chat amongst yourselves. I also just realized I have a pause screen, I think, but I forget what it is. Uh, let me try this. I think now you should see like a pause screen. Is that right? Maybe with, it's a pause screen with a J on it. Or maybe I've set up my key bindings wrong. Oh, nice. Okay, sweet. And then, uh, this is me and this is my screen, I think. So we should be back to screen now. Yeah, I love the llama. Jerry was great. Um, all right, where were we? Right, back to EV map uh, cargo. All right, so the trick now is we're gonna have EV map work in terms of left, right. That's the plan. 
Um, so that means it's going to have a dependency on left, right. Uh, and I guess it's going to be version one. I guess we don't really, I don't really know what the version of left, right should be yet. It should be like version 0 0.9. Cause it's pretty close to stable. It's, it's a transliteration of something that's worked for a long time. Um, I need to, what for workspaces? What is the recommended way? Um, specifying dependencies. No. Oh. Uh, workspace. Uh, Spin into multiple packages within the same work. Use path dependency points to the local packages and use local version to development. You can create crates IO. Yeah, okay, so I guess that's what they want you to do. So it'll be version equals this, uh, path equals dot dot left right. Uh, so now we're going to start with sort of part two, which is going to be EV map. Uh, um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Yeah, so um, having this, I, I'd grab this directly from here, which is um, if you're working in a workspace, uh, you can use a path dependency to point to the local packages within the workspace during development and then use crates.io version uh, once published. Now, whether you then have to like rewrite this each time you publish, I forget. I don't think you do. I think this will just work, uh, but it might get annoying during publishing. Um, once you do like version changes, this gets hugely painful, um, but I think this will work fine. All right, so... Um, what are we going to have to change here? Um, well, Epix is going to go away. Um, Predicate is going to stay. Operation is going to stay. Uh, right handle and the various read things are going to stay. Um, but they're mostly now going to be wrappers around the inner type. Uh, read handle factory is going to go away. Um, shallow copy is going to stay, options going to stay. Yeah. Uh, ooh. So this is an example where EVMAP actually does need a new, it can't use a default because it wants to be able to specify like the hasher for, um, it wants to be able to specify the hasher for a hash map, for example. So I do think we actually need the, um, I do think we need the version of nude that takes a thing that's clone. Uh, so this is gonna be, I think what we're gonna do is call it new from empty. Um, note, the T must be empty um, as otherwise apply first would only forget values from uh, would only forget would uh, forget not drop initial values from one of the two halves. Uh, so this is gonna now take a T uh, and it's gonna do, it's gonna take T where T is clone. It's gonna take a T here and a T here. 
Even for default, I'm not sure if we want to do this because remember for hash map, we need to ensure that they're deterministic. So they need to have the, um, the two maps need to have the same hashers. So I think we actually do want this to be clone. Um, so we're going to have like, let T is uh, T default. And we're actually just going to call new from empty T default. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned before, we can't use shallow copy for new because we don't want to shallow copy the entire T. We want the T's values to be shallow copied. If we shallow copied the T, you would have two stack like hash maps that point to the same underlying buckets, which is not what we want. Okay, so we now have new from empty. Um, so this is now really going to do... Right, so this is where EVMAP does something kind of weird. It marks the right handle as ready, but it does not mark the read handle as ready. I think the way this is gonna work is, is the, the initial inner is not gonna be ready, and then we're gonna call like a ready method on, um, we're gonna append an operation to the right handle immediately that sets it to be ready. So the for the operations up here, uh, mark ready. Um, so here, what we'll do then is let R W is um, left right new from empty T, or I guess inner, um, and the W is going to be mutable, and then we're going to append immediately append op. Uh, operation, operation, um, mark ready. And return to the RW. Uh, and then actually, this is not going to be, this is really going to be uh, our read handle. Uh, new and our right handle. So EVMAP is going to provide its own uh, wrapper types, its own wrapper types around the left and right read handles that do things like provide, uh, oops, specifically provide um, um, map specific methods on them, like handle handle, what am I doing? Right handle. Um, so right handle, for example, is gonna have an insert method, which left rights right handle does not. Um, and we're gonna have to actually write these implementations. Append op does not exist. Uh, why not? Right, because inner doesn't implement absorb, which we're going to have to get to. Um, this is probably all fine because it all goes through construct. So we're actually going to remove um, EV. Ugh, uh, oh, I guess we have to go to EV map now. We're going to remove source read. Um, factory, that one's going to go away. Um, and inner, so inner in EVMAP is kind of interesting. Inner in EVMAP is now going to be the actual type that gets shared. Mm. So we could still do what it used to do, which is this like, it has a feature to choose the map implementation. But nowadays, now that we have this like fancy generic trait, we could implement it separately for like index map and hash map, for example, and have those just be two different types. I don't really want to do that because it would mean that I have to 
duplicate the full implementation of inner and read handle and write handle for each type. Um, this is where it would be nice to have a, a collection trait or like a map trait. Because that way, EV map could be generic over its map implementation while using the underlying um, the underlying left right. But barring that, we're just going to say that you can choose it with a feature flag. Um, all right, so it's really just going to hold a map implementation of meta and a ready. So inner is actually fairly si uh, similar to what it was before. Um, And let's see here. Uh, all the debug stuff is the same. All the clone stuff is the same. Um, all the construction stuff is the same. Mark ready and is ready is going to be, um, those are going to be operations. So these are just going to be, I don't know why these are even here. These should be fairly straightforward to deal with. So I just want to get rid of them and do the same thing I do here, which is mark that as pub crate. Um, okay, so inner is easy enough. Inner doesn't really have to change because it's just the type we're going to share. Uh, write is going to be simplified significantly. So write is now just going to have a uh, handle, which is going to be a left, right, right handle of, uh, and this is where it gets tricky, of a inner k manually drop v m s and an operation k v um, and i wonder whether we can we can try to implement the first and second oper um, first and second optimizations here that may end up working i'm not quite sure Oh, right, we need to implement uh, absorb for inner. So uh, I think the apply first and apply second things are currently in the right file. Uh, yeah, they are. So these are gonna be methods on inner instead. Um, and I think the way I want to express that is to probably leave them in the right file. It seems more appropriate that it's here than an inner. Um, but I might come to regret it. Uh, left, right, absorb, operation KV for inner K uh, V M S. Not a lot of generic parameters. Absorb first. Um, absorb second. Uh, and we're also going to have to do here a, what did we call the last method? Uh, a drop first. Uh, and that one is unimplemented for now. Oh yeah, I mean now that um, now that this is generic, now, now that left right is generic, you could pretty easily have any any type you want as the inner type, whether that's a binary tree or a heap or a map or a counter, as we talked about before. Arguably, that's the other thing we should do is try to implement like a, a test suite for a simple counter. Um, this one is going to be a little bit annoying, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, Actually, I can maybe talk about that now. The trait absorb operation typer typer requires, right, this is unsafe. 
um, and K V M S. Oh man, and that's going to require. I guess actually that's going to require all the different types we have here in right. It's going to be pretty annoying. Um, right, and this is now missing uh, operation mark ready, which really is just going to be uh, inner dot ready equals true. And same thing down here. That's a new operation we added. All right, that's fine. Um, okay, so we have absorb for inner now, which should mean that now we should be able to write to construct one. Um, Right, so here's where, where this gets a little annoying. Um, you see how it says the trait bound uh, inner, basically this says that absorb is not implemented for inner manually drop. That's true, we implemented absorb only for inner of kvms, not k manually drop vms. Um, and the, the, the manually drop bit here is a little bit of, I think I mentioned it briefly earlier, a little bit of trickiness that right handle does, which is instead of trying to keep track of, instead of manually calling like forget versus drop in apply first and apply second, what it does is just, if we're applying first, uh, then it uses a, uh, a type that has manually drop V as the, as the type that absorb gets called on. And if it's apply second, then it uses um, just V as the type that it gets called on. That won't really work anymore. Like this now just has to be V always. Um, but I think the way we're gonna get around this, the way we're gonna be able to keep that simplicity, which was kind of nice, uh, is that in apply first, ugh, or actually, no, the way we're going to get around this is to have, uh, yeah, no, it is going to be V absorb for V is that, ugh, uh, this is going to take mute self and it's going to take uh, other. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that inner is going to cast self to be a, um, to be a manually drop. It's not quite as nice. But I know that it's I know that it's okay. Uh, yeah, so this is gonna have to be unsafe, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, which is we're gonna have to do a mem transmute here. Okay, so let me write this out and then explain what it does. Let's see if that works. Yeah, so um, we're given in here an inner KVMS, but we're told to absorb first. What that means is we shouldn't drop any values. We should only ever forget them. And instead of trying to make sure that all the code below here, like that we explicitly call forget anytime something might drop a value, like we wouldn't be able to call just clear on a vector because that's going to drop them. We would have to like walk the vector and forget each element. Instead of doing that, what we're going to do is just um, tr change the type of inner to have the values be wrapped in manually drop so that dropping them will not actually drop the inner value. So this is a super sneaky little trick. Um, and 
what I have to do here is cast the self that I'm given, which thinks that it owns the V, into a, uh, the same value, but where the Vs are manually dropped. Uh, and I can't do that with a simple cast, like with an S, because the compiler doesn't know that these are the same type at all. Clearly, what I'm doing here is super unsafe. And so I have to use mem transmute um, to transmute self. And the, the syntax here is transmute is a function that takes two generic parameters, the from type and the to type. The from type is dictated by the argument I pass in, and the to type is uh, what I want out. Uh, and you can you can see that if we go to uh, transmute. Uh, where's the yeah? Transmute tu takes a t gives you a u. Are all types with manually drop in the generic parameter guaranteed to have the same in-memory representation at the same time without the manually drop? I believe that to be true. If certainly if that's not true, this is not safe. Uh, let's go check. Uh, manually drop T is subject to the same layout optimizations as T. It has no effect on the assumptions the compiler makes about its contents. So it should be. Uh, I think putting the type that we transmuted into after the let inner would be a lot cleaner. Yeah, you're probably right. Uh, we can do that instead. Uh, so that would be this. Oh no. Uh, MS. Uh, that works too. That's arguably cleaner. Uh, make sure that no methods below um, drop values since we're only operating on the first uh, instance of each value, the first shallow copy of each value. Uh, and then safety, um, manually drop t has the same layout as t. Um, and then for absorb second down here, uh, this one is just going to take a mute self, just the way that it is, and uh, other, which is going to be self. And I'm guessing that all of the uh, all of the complaints here is that I don't have a hasher, so let's just go ahead and get that. Oh, is it not dot hasher? Uh, dot data dot hasher. And we'll do the same thing here. And here, let inner is self. But yeah, just to minimize the diff. Technically, I could now use self here rather than inner, but um, but I'd rather keep the diff small if we can. Um, no methods. Yeah, you're right. All right, so we only have 68 errors to go. That seems good. Um, so right handle now is really just a wrapper around this handle business. So um, maybe what we do here is, I don't think we can do the first and second optimization actually. Um, I'll show that in a second. Um, but this is really just gonna be um, handle now, because it doesn't have all these fields. And I'll leave those commented out for now because they might come later. Um, creating a new right handle no longer require epics. Um, in fact, creating a new right handle now, all it requires is a left right uh, right handle over an operation KV. Um, and I think the other thing we want is uh, just like before, 
we probably want this to just be a method on right handle. Oops, that's too much. So we'll just stick that up here. Um, so that's gonna take a W handle and return a self. Um, uh, it doesn't have to have all these where bounds because they're already on the impl block. Uh, and all it really needs to do is stick in the handle there. So remember the, the handle now, the right handle here is really just a super thin wrapper around, um, uh, around the left, right, right handle that provides nicer access to inserting things into the op log. That's all it really does. Couldn't the compiler rearrange the order of fields of inner versus inner whatever. So even if manually drop V is V, the inner type is not the same. Um, they shouldn't be. They should be, um, they should be subject to the same layout restrictions. So they should be laid out exactly the same. Um, now, we don't need wait anymore. Um, and refresh, we do kind of need refresh um, in the sense that we just want to call self handle refresh. That's all it needs to do. Um, similarly with flush, we probably want to expose that to our callers. Remember, we probably don't want this to deref mute into the inner right handle because that would expose methods like um, like uh, handle op or append op. Um, so we're just gonna rewire these to to redirect inside. Um, oh, this is a why is this written as a mem swap? That's real weird. Um, so I guess we want another op log here, which is like a uh, set meta. M. Uh, and that also, oh no. This means that the, oh, there's so much documentation. This means that we need an M here now as well, which means that anywhere that takes an operation now has to include the M in there. It's like the hell of generic parameters. Um, where is, there we go. Absorb, absorb, absorb. Uh, and this now also has a, I guess, operation set meta, which takes the meta and unsurprisingly sets the meta to be that. Um, and similarly down here, great. Now apply first is, this is probably gonna complain because uh, when we get a set meta operation, I think we already have uh, M implements copy or something, M implements clone. Um, so when apply first is called, right, we only get a mutable reference to the operation. We don't get to take ownership of it, which means we only have a mutable reference to the meta as well. So we're gonna have to clone that out here, I think. Uh, I don't know, it's probably, it doesn't, there are too many compile errors for it to realize this particular error yet. Um, but yeah, all the, the application of the operational log stays the same. Um, let's see what else we have up here. So we have add op, which used to be the same thing as sort of append op, like we have in left, right, right handle. Um, and this is where the first uh, optimization came in where if you haven't refreshed yet, you uh, you know that there are no readers in your right handle because you just created the map. 
So you can just do the operations directly into the map. The reason this op optimization was helpful was because when you first create a type, chances are you want to like dump a bunch of stuff into it. And it's really annoying if you have, if those all have to go through the op log when it's not technically necessary. Mm. We might be able to fix this. Um, so I guess this would be self handle append op. And otherwise, we have to do some real sneaky. I don't think we're going to be allowed to do this because without changing left, right. So basically uh, here, we want to get a mutable reference directly to the inner. Um, but all that left, right provides us with is the, the sort of, it's an apply op that you get a mutable reference to the inner because that's when it can guarantee that there are no readers there. And apart from that, all it ever gives us is an immutable reference to the read side. Whereas here, what we're trying to get is a mutable reference to the right side. And uh, left, right has no way to, to promise that that is safe to do, so it doesn't provide that method. But if we wanted to enable this optimization, what we would have to do is have um, like a, an unsafe, actually it doesn't need to be unsafe. Um, what we would have is a method on left, right handle that is specifically, um, raw right handle it takes a mutable reference to self and returns a mutable pointer to t and the reason we want this to be a pointer is because we can give out a pointer and then the caller has to like in order to make that immutable reference they can actually use for something they have to write an unsafe block it's not unsafe for us to give out the pointer but it is unsafe for them to try to mutate through it because there's no guarantee that there aren't any readers but this is all that we really need for the optimization to work um so this is just going to be i guess um Let's see here. I think it's just going to be this. Um, now, why is this unwrap okay? Um, this unwrap is okay because. Uh, Right handle is only null uh, after drop. I don't know why it even is an option. Like why is W handle an option? Like do we ever take it? I don't think we do. Oh, we take it here. I don't think there's a good reason for us to do this. Hmm. So I think what we Hmm. So the reason for the option here is because we're using box into raw to get the pointer from the right handle. Um, I feel like this is something I fixed on a branch. This doesn't actually need to do that. Um, hmm. But that's fine. It's just a little awkward. This is something we could fix later. Like it, the, 
the W handle will only ever be none like between here and here, um, which is when we do the swap. So it should basically never be none uh, observed externally from from weight. I'm pretty sure we could rewrite the code to not have that be an option, but I'm gonna not meddle too much with that code at the moment and, and have it work this way instead. Um, and this is gonna be a manually drop T, I think. Wait, why is this? Oh, right. Um, this could also, does this need to include the manually drop? I don't think that's an important detail. Uh, so this we can do as uh, star mute manually drop T as star mute. Oh, that's real ugly Rust format. Why you why you do this to me? Oh. Um, so now uh, the sort of add op on. So that add op that we have on the EV map right handle, I think can now do this optimization, which is it grabs the handle. Um, why does it need to get the hasher from the read handle? That, I mean, that's fine, I guess, but... Uh, Yeah, but I don't want to have to enter here either. I feel like this could use the handle from either side, to be honest. Yeah, I think this can use the hasher from either side. Uh, so, so this is just gonna be Hasher is going to be actually it, it's going to we're going to make this into a reference here. Um, so s the reason why this is safe is because uh, we know there are no outstanding readers uh, since we haven't refreshed ever before. Uh, and then the hasher can now be w inner dot hasher. I guess dot data dot hasher. Um, and now it's going to complain about other things, which is going to be annoying. Uh, we don't need do drop anymore. This is just gonna work. Um, but getting the hasher is gonna be a little bit annoying. Because we're gonna do basically this, right? Apply second. Uh, why not? Absorb. Apply second W hasher this. Oh, right. I need to actually use that. Left, right, absorb. I need to use the trait in order to call the trait. That's fine. And I guess now where we implement absorb, we don't need to name it. Um, this is <laughs> absorb second. Uh, it takes a W inner and a hasher. But the, ooh, right. Uh, so this is gonna complain because, oh, actually, I guess it actually wants the, the data, but we can't actually do that because the uh, R handle, I guess. 
because the borrow checker is gonna kick and scream here saying that we're ooh, right um that we're accessing w inner both mutably and immutably and it's right right we're, we're calling absorb second which requires a mutable reference to the inner but then we're trying to also give an immutable reference to the same thing here which is clearly also not okay um we could call enter here um that's like a cheap enough ob like operation anyway um so we could call uh R handle dot enter. So not R handle. Oh, uh, self dot handle dot enter. Uh, dot expect. Um, Map has not yet been destroyed. Um, this does mean that we're going to end up like taking an epic, but taking an epic here is basically free because there we are the only writer and we're not waiting. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so now we have the, the self-first operation. And the self-first operation here, um, uh, optimization I mean, uh, actually seems to work, right? We get a, we, we happen to know here that there haven't been any refreshes and therefore we do have exclusive access to the right handle. Uh, and that means that we can just uh, directly absorb the operation rather than add it to the op log. Just absorb it directly into W inner and then not store it in the up log. Um, of course, as this note point out too, because we did this, the, the next time we try to apply operations, like basically after the next refresh, um, the op log is going to be empty. And so we're going to have to have we're gonna to have to clone the right handle into the read handle uh, on the next refresh because there's no op log to copy over because we didn't add these operations to the op log. Uh, there is, the, the reason this is if not self first, um, someone asked in chat is because this is, um, this is just the, the sort of uh, happy path or the common path rather, it's not the happy path, but the common path. Um, that's why I put it first. Um, I see there's a bunch of discussion of whether whether it's okay the transmute I'm doing uh, transmute. Whether it's okay for me to transmute a uh, inner kvms into an inner k manually drop vms. Um, so, okay, to take a quick aside, um, the reason this discussion arises is because. V and manually drop V are guaranteed to have the same layout of by, by the compiler. We know this from manually drop. The question is whether like some type V, some type generic over V is guaranteed to have the same layout as some type generic over manually drop V. Um, I'd be very surprised if it wasn't, but you're right that I don't know. So let me... Let's see. So what does the Nomicon say about this? Mm. So the Nomicon is a really great way to look up like basically stuff about uh, any unsafe code. Um, yeah, so Rust does not guarantee that an instance of A in this case has the same field ordering or padding as an instance of B, even though they have the same fields in the same order. The question is whether this applies to generics as well. This is not quite the same. Um, Yeah, so it doesn't really say, right? So, okay, this example indicates that maybe they could be different. 
but it's not really the same case. The case we have here is like struct A generic over T uh, and then is A of I32 the same as A of manually drop I32, which happens to have the same layout. I don't know. Um, it is true that we rely on that here and that may not be safe to rely on. Um, I wonder if unsafe co uh, co code guidelines. So there's a, um, there's a Rustlang uh, working group called the Unsafe Code Guidelines Working Group. Uh, and I think this is the kind of stuff that they've been looking at. So let's see what they say here. Um, that's not quite the same. Uh, that's also not quite the same. Uh, Repper transparent. Let's see if they have any discussion of Repper transparent. Mm. No, that's not quite the same. That's also not quite the same. All the end fields are single. That's similar, but not quite the same. Um, also not quite the same. I guess we want repper transparent generic. Uh, Representation of structs. Yeah, so clearly a lot of discussion. I don't know what the conclusion was. Let's go down here. Mm. Only reordering is still mandating greedy's padding. That would certainly help. Um, ooh, collection transmute. Let's see what that says. This is like diving pretty deep into... Um, Technically with generics, you could even have different sizes. Yeah, but it's specifically the case when we know that the layout is the same because it's repper transparent. Um, that seems, yeah, that's not what we want. Um, all right, let's see what this chapter says. Representations of structs. All right. And let's look at this from master, just in case. This is like diving pretty deep, but it's important. Oh, it's not on master, that's good. Uh, reference, reference, source. Layout, structs and tuples, all right. <laughs> the statements here are not yet guaranteed until an RFC. Um, struct types. In terms of the layout, tuples, that's tuple structs. I don't really care about those. Um, the layout of these fields themselves is already entirely determined by their types. And since we intend to allow creating references to fields, struct do not have any wiggle room here. 
Aha. All right, default layout. Default layout is not specified. Have not yet reached a full consensus. Um, not required to select the same layout across compilations. That's fine. Two structs with the same field types may not be laid out in the same way. <laughs> Naturally, in practice, the compiler aims to produce deterministic output. Uh, as, the t as of the time of this writing, the compiler will reorder struct fields to minimize the overall size of the struct. So that suggests that currently, at least, this is fine because the layout is the same. Um, this seems like a good, I guess it's an unresolved question. Um, Yeah, it's sort of like de deterministic layout, I guess, is sort of what we're after. Um, yeah, like this is a good question, right? Uh, whether it's deterministic only dependent on certain properties of the fields. Like if the if all that all that matters is the size and layout of each field, then our two things should be the same. Um, But yeah, it seems appealing. Yeah, so here's an example of like substitution. Might be worth for us to like chime in on this discussion, but I don't know. Yeah, so here's right, like I suggest repertransparent transparent equivalent would still be enough. Uh, All right, so it sounds like we need to chime in on this discussion to move that forward. Um, we could make this rep C, but I don't really want to make it rep C. So I'm gonna keep it the way it is, and then I'm gonna uh, add a comment to this discussion after the stream finishes. Um, but I think it's fine for now. All right, um, okay, so now we have the first optimization, which is that if we haven't swapped yet, then we just do the modification directly to the map because we know that no one else has it. And then what we need to deal with is um, if we're trying to refresh, uh, and uh, we can see this in, so remember I changed refresh to be, to just call the inner handle refresh. Um, but in reality, that's not quite what we want. Uh, so we're gonna do source write rs. Um, so it used to be that refresh did, uh, where is it, here. It did a wait, and after the wait, it did a second. That's going to be a problem. Ah, I know what we can do. Okay, I think I think we can still do this. So, uh Okay, this is going to be a little bit ugly, but I think it's going to work. Which is that um we're actually going to uh so what I was thinking here was that we could append an operation that's like uh, do do uh, do the second pass of copying over, but it might just be a pain. Uh, kind of tempted to get it to work, but I think it's also going to be a lot of pain. Um, let's. Right, so what I was thinking here, right, was self handle uh, append op um, append op like operation um, swap in read uh, just clone maybe. Um, Uh, 
Um, so that would be one way to do it. It might mean that we end up with an op log that has a lot of these operations. Uh, but I guess we could we could get around that. Okay, this is gonna be, this is a little ridiculous, but um, so I guess maybe maybe we just do like enum optimization step. So we can either be no refresh. Uh, queued clone is bool, or it can be um, um, or it can be the right uh, right side empty, or it can be none. So I guess I, I decided to go against myself in uh, in saying that I would not change things around. Uh, All right, so the idea here is gonna be that if, oh, drop for right handle can now go away. That's really nice. Um, so this handle is going to start out with the optimization being optimization, no refresh has happened yet, and we have not queued a clone yet. Um, we're going to match here on self.optimization. Uh, if we're in optimization, no refresh, then whatever. If we're in optimization right side empty, then whatever. Uh, and if we're in optimization none, whatever. Um, I think that's gonna happen after the refresh. Uh, so this is just gonna move the optimization forward. Uh, optimization right side empty. Optimization none and optimization none. Uh, if right, so if we're in the case where optimization where we haven't done a refresh uh, a refresh yet. Uh, optimization, then, then we're gonna uh, just do the, if, if a refresh hasn't happened yet, we know that we own the right handle, so we're just gonna do the modification directly to the right handle. Uh, if we haven't queued a clone, then we need to queue uh, a clone operation. The reason for this is if we didn't do this, uh, absorb wouldn't be called for our operation. Um, and therefore the, the copy would never happen. We need there to be at least one operation in the op log that tells us that we need to pull in everything from the read handle into the write handle. Um, but we only want to do that once. We don't want the op log to fill up with tons and tons of these things. Um, and if we're not in that optimization state, we're just gonna, we're just gonna append the, the operation to the queue as normal. So we're gonna have here a just clone R handle. Um, and what is this gonna look like? Well, in apply or absorb first, I guess. If the operation we get is just clone R handle, what does that mean? Um, so, so apply first is going to be applied to the right handle that we have already modified. So we're going to do nothing. Uh, 
This is applying the operation to the right handle, to the original right handle. Just, uh, actually, is that true? Yeah, to the original right handle, um, which we already applied the uh, first batch of operations to. If we're told to apply it second, that means that now uh, we're applying the the this means that it's the first refresh that's happened and the right handle is the original read handle uh, uh, which is empty and needs to copy over all data from the uh, right handle that we wrote to directly. So in this case, inner.data is just going to be um, I guess dot extend uh, well is that even really gonna work that may not work well what did it used to do on second it used to get the r handle yeah, it used to have this comment in it. So really, it would be nice if we could just clone here. But remember the problem around hashing. We need to make sure that the... Uh, we need to make sure that the... Any bucket, any um, like value sets that get created in the in the map all use the same hasher, which means that we need to pass in a hasher, um, which means that we can't just clone over the whole map. Actually, maybe we could clone over. I feel like we might be able to clone the whole map, but I'm gonna not risk that. So we have the R handle, don't we? Oh, I guess it's called other. Like so. And who knows why this is complaining. Type V cannot be dereferenced. That's fine. Uh, ooh. That looks ugly. Oh, it's, um, it's like a manually drop challenge here, which is, Values from the, this is going to be a manually drop new of that. I think. Who? Little unclear. Right, so inner here is a, a thing that holds Vs. So why can't I give it these? Values manually drop. Oh, I see this gives me back, the shallow copy here gives me a manually drop and I need to make those not be manually drops somehow. So into inner. Into. All oh, right, this is actually manually drop into inner that thing. All right. Um, yeah, and then I think actually we don't even need this this right side empty thing. Uh, so really, this is just an 
option. So this can be, uh, instead of calling it something grandiose like optimization, it can be called, um, can be called just direct write. Uh, so initially, direct write is going to be sum, uh, and the inner value is false to indicate that the, I guess we should document that up here. Um, if sum uh, write directly to the uh, right handle map, since no refresh has happened. Uh, sum false indicates that uh, no, that the necessary operation uh, just clone R handle has not yet been appended to the op log for when a refresh does happen. And this can now just do take. In fact, it doesn't even have to do that. It can just set that equal to none. Once we've done a refresh, we can no longer do um, direct writes. And now we can say if let sum is direct write, then we do that. Uh, can you replace? Uh, can you replace the star V with V as ref? Uh, probably. I don't know if that's nicer, but... Oh, uh, it has to be D ref, um, which means I have to use a trait, which seems not worth it. All right, where's our error now? Uh... Inner with capacity IIC is manually drop. So I think what we want is for our, we don't have, we don't need do drop anymore. We don't use that. Uh, these I think is actually gonna do just this. Expected read read handle. So where's our new? Why does it complain about this thing? Oh, it's from. Ah, it can just be new instead. New seems fine. It's a private function anyway. All right. So now we're getting, we've gotten pretty far, right? So now write doesn't really have any stuff in it about um, uh, like refreshing or, uh, or like any of the epic stuff, like none of that is in write anymore. Now it's only just tons and tons and tons of, um, uh, tons and tons of, and tons of, um, map specific operations. Uh, why does this even need to deref? Oh, I think this is going to be annoying. That's going to be a left right read handle of inner of that. All right, so now we need to get to the, ooh. All oh, right, the, it's complaining about the tests, that's fine. So let's look at the read side now. Uh, reads should also be a lot simpler now. 
Uh, factory goes away, that's great. Uh, read handle should now only really have a uh, handle, which is gonna be a left, right read handle. And again, to an inner of that. Um, and it shouldn't really have anything else. Uh, we don't have to implement drop specifically anymore, uh, which also means that we don't need to have these anymore. Oh, we do for inner to make sense. Um, which means that this implementation is now just handle. Uh, we can actually just derive clone, but we're not gonna, the reason we're not gonna derive clone is we uh, we don't need, so if we derive clone, it's also gonna say that K, V, M, and S need to implement clone. Uh, we don't really care about that. Um, so we are just gonna do uh, self handle is self handle clone. Uh, what else do we got? This thing, is now gonna go into read handle. Uh, so this is gonna be a pub create new. That's gonna take a handle, which is gonna be a left right a handle again. No epics. And really it's just gonna write wrap self with that handle. And again, the only purpose really of us having a wrapper type here is um, we have the wrapper type so that um, we can provide map specific methods on this. It's no longer a handle that can go away. That's all handled by left, right. Um, hasher, we no longer need in here. Um, I guess we can still have read but I don't kind of want to call this enter again. I guess if we're doing a breaking release anyway, we might as well. Um, and that's going to give me an enter. And that's going to create a map read ref. That's fine. Um, this, I guess, is going to be enter, enter, enter. All of these are just going to be enter. Uh, right, I need to. Uh, that's just because map, we haven't fixed up map read ref yet. Um, this is just going to be map, but it's actually going to be left. Uh, I'll have to deal with that in a second. That's going to be mad re map read ref map. Uh, once we're done with it, um, do we even use? Well, I guess that's going to be a read guard. Oh, I see. So read is actually a little different. Um, read gives you okay. So so in the in EV map side of things, we actually have two kinds of guards. We have a read guard, and then we have a uh, map read ref. And map read ref is basically a read guard specifically for the map. Um, I don't know if we need this distinction anymore. I think map read ref is all you really need. I see read guard is actually used for M, but I think this can just be a left right read guard and no one's gonna care. Um, and this is gonna be this. Um, that's fine. This is going to be left, right, read guard. So that means that we're not even going to have a read guard here. I don't think. 
Like, what does our read guard do? Yeah, nothing really. Nothing that map read ref couldn't do. So I think we're not going to have a guard. We're just going to have read ref, uh, which means that we can rm source read uh, guard. Um, I think I found proof that manually drop transmute is unsound. All right, let's check this out. This is why it's nice to have chat because people can check things up while I'm coding. Um, guaranteed to have the same size alignment in ABI. This is for maybe uninit, not... Um, because any bit values ah so this is not quite the same it's similar i mean the, this first sentence right is pointing out specifically what we saw on the other thread that there's no formal guarantee that they're the same but in practice the compiler compiler currently treats them the same um they go on here to say that specifically because any bit value is valid for maybe uninit, the compiler can't apply um, optimizations. That's not true for um, may, uh, manually drop. For manually drop, it has the same validity requirements as maybe uninit. Um, you can't stick, like if you have a manually drop bool, you can't stick like arbitrary bit values in the bool. Um, for maybe on in it, you can stick any bit value you want in that bool. Um, so it can, the compiler can optimize manually drop just like it optimizes um, uh, manually, it can optimize manually drop T the same way as it optimizes T. So I think that should be fine. Um, but you are right that, that this is something that, that's clearly not guaranteed by the compiler, but it seems to be what it currently does. And that's why I want to follow up on this um, on this thread, specifically pointing out this issue and see what they say. Um, it's true, we could just rep or see it. Um, rep or see has some other implications that are kind of sad, but maybe that's worthwhile. I think for now I want to keep it and then point out the issue. Um, but I mean, it's a good it's a good problem to to point out for sure. Uh, all right, so we can tidy up this quite a bit. Don't need mem anymore. That's always a good sign. Um, so this is, I guess, this is a left right read guard. We can reuse the left right read guards because all they're really doing is they deref into the inner type. Um, we might be able, we might want to re export left right read guard. Um, that might be good. Uh, I really want. Oh, I see. This should be self handle enter. That's what we want. This should be self handle enter this should be handle enter um this one's trickier uh this one is like if inner is none then none, uh, else uh, inner dot uh, left right read guard map inner uh, as ref unwrap data get key. Map of inner. Why 
why would this be? Oh, right. Um, yeah, so this one's a little awkward. This is why it had map opt, which is, it's not that we need to do this. It's that inner.data.get of key, what this is going to return is a read guard, well, left, right, read guard of option like V. But what we want to return from the function is a option read guard V. Um, that's not really a nice way for us to do that. Actually, maybe there is. Yeah, so this is why I think I think we can't do this with a normal map. We're going to have to basically do uh, let value is this. So we're going to map out the data for the key. And if the value is none, then that. Otherwise, we have to map again to value. Uh, Value uh, inner dot unwrap. What am I doing? Something silly. There we go. Mismatch types. Yeah, I was worried about that. Yeah, we, we might actually just need map opt. There might not be a nice way to do this without map opt, which is, okay, so the, the problem here is that get returns an option of a reference, uh, but map requires that we return um, a ref, actually, why does it require that we return a reference? Can we just fix that instead? Like if map was not required to return that, but just did this. Um, and now I do want you to be sized. Is that fine? Oh, it's because this internally stores a T, doesn't it? Uh, Well, this is probably going to be weird. Hmm. See, that's a good question. I wonder what they do for uh, ref mute, for example. So what's the signature for ref mute? Yeah, so they do the same thing. They do the same thing this used to do. Um, and then the map that they provide is the same type of map that we provide. But I think that means you can't really do options, which is pretty awkward. Um, like, we could always return this. But that doesn't seem quite right either. So I think we do actually want a uh, map opt here, which is kind of silly, but um, oh, actually, maybe we don't. Maybe I'm just being silly. So this gives us something that deref's. Uh, now the problem is we can't, this gives us an option ref, but we have to return a ref itself, uh, which won't work here. Um, so I think we do need a map opt, or I guess a try map. Um, although 
try should really be a result. If we had the try trait, that'd be great, but we don't. Uh, so this is gonna have to be a option U. Um, and this is gonna be that, and this is gonna be this. And it returns an option read guard. So now we're gonna just do try map of that. And it complains because the value is manually drop. It doesn't have to be because we're giving a reference to it. Whew. Can't you write to a mutable option variable in the outer scope in the map and return in the map? Um, I don't think you can because we want to, because um, we actually have to return the guard. Like we had, it's we're returning a guarded value. We don't want to we don't want to clone out the value or anything, right? We want to return a guarded value, which is basically a guarded reference. Um, so we can't move. We like if we if we did like a mute val is none, and then we did like a map where we set val equals this. That wouldn't work because the the return the the thing that we stick inside val is tied to the lifetime of inner so if we tried to return val it would say this has this lives as long as the inner does and we're not allowed to drop inner think of it as like if we returned the if we tried to return just the reference that would mean that we drop the guard which releases the epic which means we now have a pointer into the map but we've also released the epic so the writer might overwrite that value so that won't I don't think that will work. Um, what else we have? We have left, right, read guard. And this presumably does a try map as well. Ooh. Right, uh, we called this read guard try map. Fantastic. Uh, and this now doesn't have to do that anymore. Wait, did I, I did something stupid here, didn't I? What did I do that was stupid? Oh. I see what I did. I think I need to do read guard try map read guard try map of this thing. Wait, I thought that's what I did. I mean, clearly I'm doing something silly here, but what? So get raw returns an option. So what we get back here is a read guard to values. Like just to see if I'm being silly, if I do this, does it work? Oh, I, I'm entirely being stupid. Uh, the old version here uses map ref, not try map. So really, I'm just being silly, and this needs to be map. This just needs to be map with this. Uh, I thought, <laughs> and apparently I was wrong.
Why is this given a manually drop? I've definitely been doing something strange here with... I have a manually drop somewhere where I shouldn't have a manually drop. And I think I have it... I think I have it... Oh, this expects to take a manually drop, I see. But there's no reason to remove the manually drop anymore. So that can just go away. Which means that this can go away. Great. Um, get one, left, right. Read guard. This this one is a map op. Okay, so left, right, read guard. Um, really, I should give. I should use this to avoid having to type it each time. Uh, try map of that with this. Uh, except it no longer has to be user friendly, and it does this right thing. So, so far, like this transition is going pretty nicely, I think. Um, like, these are mostly mechanical changes because the types changed. Oops, uh, left, right, read, handle, try, try map of inner with this thing and this map is no longer necessary read guard try map is destroyed is just handle dot is destroyed This does a, uh, this should be an enter. That's probably fine. This should be a, not just a normal map. This should be an enter. All right. So now we need map read ref, which is at least in theory, the last thing that we need. No read guard. That's true. Oh, there's no read guard. So what am I even doing? I can just use left, right, read guard. Left, right, read guard is just gonna be read guard. Because there is no left, there's no read guard redefined in EV map now. That's nice. So this can now use left, right, read guard as well. This holds a V. Uh, read guard iter. Gets pretty close, except it doesn't need manually drop anymore. Doesn't need to call user friendly anymore. Uh, user friendly. So user friendly is just like a helper type that uh, maps from things that are manually dropped to things that are that just remove the manually drop, uh, and that's because all of all of the read stuff only operates on um, on ref like re like shared references anyway. So there's nothing really for them to deal with. Um. Uh, all right, what else we got? We're getting pretty close, I think. 
uh, write RS121. That's in 121. Set meta. So that should just be add op um, operation set meta meta. Why does this return M? Oh, it used to return the old meta, even though that's not really documented. Uh, that's awkward. We're gonna have it not do that. Although I did realize that, um, Yeah, no, that seems great. All right, what else we got? Uh, we've got something here in lib. Right, new. Is it compile? So close. Read guard is private. Yeah, we're no longer going to expose read guard. I guess we might want to. Yeah, we'll pub use left, right, read guard. <gasps> Almost compiles. Uh, read, and I also want to do the same change we did here of moving read mod to read.rs. So read, read rs, line 176, what we got here? Cannot borrow self handle is mutable. Right, so this is definitely one of the big annoyances, right? That now with a read handle, all these methods now need to take mute self. Like get one is going to take a mutable reference to self. Get is going to take a mutable reference to self. Get raw, like this is what I was sort of trying to avoid. Um, With having, uh, with having read handle not be sync and just having it do uh, an immutable reference to self instead. Um, in practice, it probably doesn't make too much of a difference because you couldn't alias a read guard anyway. So I guess we'll just have to keep this the way it was. Um, but yeah, it is a little weird that a read handle requires you to have a mutable reference to self to call a given method. Um, oh. oh, we're getting somewhere. Right, 322. Oh, where is it trying to move? It's trying to move down on 405. I love the compiler. Uh, this is going to be ref M. It's like, oh, you're trying to move out of this thing because here. Nice. Um, right, 134. Cannot borrow self handle as mutable. Right, we're gonna wanna do this actually. Right, what do we got here? Cannot borrow is mutable. Self dot handle. Mm. So the right handle. 
only gives us an immutable reference to its read guard, to its read handle. Uh, but now that that all takes mutable references, that it has to implement deref mute. Um, so down here, we also have to implement deref mute, um, which is fine. There's nothing really preventing us from having that be safe. Um, Right, 539. No, the other right. 549. Yeah. Ooh. So this is the downside of us doing all this wrapping is that it's not clear how we provide reads through the right handle in EVMAP because it only holds a right handle. Um, and the right handle gives us access to a left right read handle, but it doesn't give us access to a EV map read handle. We could construct uh, an EV map read handle, but then we wouldn't match the DREF trait. Um, one option here is to store our read handle ourselves here, but that seems ugly too. Um, hmm. So do you see the problem here? So we have um, the, the, let me go back up the definition. So the right handle in EV map, all it really stores is a, a left, right, right handle. However, we would like for it to be possible if you have a right handle to call read handle methods on the right handle. Um, and the way we did this before was that right handle would deref into a read handle. Unfortunately, in our case, the while we have a right handle, uh, deref of this right handle will give us a left right right handle, not an EV map right handle, which means that the only methods you can call are the methods on a left right read handle, which is really just like. Uh, accessing the, like it's really just calling enter, which only gives you the non-map specific methods, which is kind of sad. Um, we don't really have a way to give you a EV map read handle from a right handle. Um, we could provide you with a method that's like, call this and it will create a read handle for you that wraps the inner one. But it's not very nice to work with. We'd need an enter on right handle itself. Um, er, yeah, not like the other way to do this, right, is to have an R handle stored in the right handle, uh, which is a like a proper read handle like this. Um, it's a little unfortunate. It means we have an extra epic lying around, but it, it seems nicer than having to provide this like enter functionality. Uh, wait, why? Why does, oh, I'm being silly. Um, whoa, all oh, right. Yeah, so with this, we can now have uh, both deref and deref mute into a read handle at the cost of storing sort of an unnecessary extra epoch. So this is now gonna target a read handle. Um, and this is going to give you a mutable read handle. Uh, 
Uh, and it doesn't even have to go through DRF. And now we're going to have to make sure that we construct that. Uh, these are all in tests. I don't care about tests yet. Line 93. So this is going to have to do an R handle, which is going to be a uh, it's going to be a read handle. Huh? <laughs> How's this even going to work? It's going to be a read handle new. Yeah, read handle new from handle dot from left right read handle clone of dereferencing handle. I think. Okay, that was a little bit of a magical incantation. But what we want to do is we want to construct a new EVMap read handle that we can stick inside our EVMap right handle. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to take the left right right handle, dereference it so we get a left right read handle, uh, clone that left right read handle. So now we have a, an owned left right read handle. And then we construct a new uh, EVMap read handle from that. Um, the other way we could go about doing this is we could have like map the map methods of read handle be like a um, a trait that we implement for left right read handle that would also work but it would mean that people have to import the trait in order to call any of our methods would would be a little annoying. Yeah, it's. It's annoying that right and right are pronounced the same in English and that the opposite of right is left and also wrong. It's a little annoying. Um, uh, what do we need to clone? We need to clone because in order to construct a read handle, um, like an EVMap read handle, an EVMap read handle is a wrapper around a left-right read handle but it's a wrapper around an owned left-right read handle. Um, and the the one that's, we can only get um, shared access to the one, or mutable access, but we can't own the one that's already in the right handle. We can't extract it, so we have to clone it. But this is cheap, like this is just when you initially construct the right handle. So this is not an operation you do like all the time. <gasps> it compiles. Okay, so there's no longer a use for user friendly. That's good. Write no longer needs a bunch of its imports. That's good. Values no longer needs manually drop. Inner no longer needs manually drop. Lib no longer needs a bunch of things that are imported up here. That's good. Love deleting code. Okay, so now we have EVMap compiling as well. The tests will not probably not compile yet because they um, rely on access to private fields in what are now in left right. Um, but let's see. Let's do a cargo test. Let's do a um, lib test first. Yeah, as you see, it depends on this refreshes field and on being able to look directly into the op log. And um, neither of these are things that we currently have access to. Um, 583, what we got here? Um, that should be enter. Um, Yeah, I think realistically, these tests probably all need to be on left, right instead.
Um, so if we take grab all of these, I'm gonna left, right, right. Um, and actually, sh <laughs> why not? All right, so we're gonna do something wonky. Uh, we're gonna do config test. We're gonna impl absorb. We're gonna have a enum uh, counter operations. It's gonna have add and subtract. And uh, so it's gonna have for now absorb uh, counter operation counter operation uh, T for you're gonna have a struct counter also T which just holds a T for Actually, I don't want this to be generic. What am I doing? That seems entirely unnecessary. This is just gonna be for testing anyway. Uh, so we're gonna impl counter operate, uh, absorb counter operation for I32. Oh, we haven't implemented, um, we haven't implemented clear, the, the drop first. We're gonna have to do that actually. Um, but give me a second before I do that. Actually, let's do that right now before I forget. So remember there's a drop first method. Um, it used to be that that's just called clear. So let's look at what clear does. Well, clear just adds the operation clear. I feel like that probably didn't work in the past. Cause Mm, no, it called clear on the map itself. Mm. And that's what we'll want to do here too, which is um, for drop first, we're gonna wanna do inner.clear like this. that we don't drop values since we're only dropping the first child copy of each value. So actually drop first is pretty straightforward, right? Um, we again pull the trick where we transmute into manually drop so that when we call clear, clear is not actually gonna drop any of the values, but it is gonna like, um, well, I guess actually, um, maybe drop first should not take a mute self, but a self. But it's actually gonna be hard to do that, I think. Because where we call it, we only have a mute self. Um, oh, this is gonna be really annoying. Yeah, it's gonna be really annoying. Hmm. Mm. Actually, we don't need, well, all right, let me try to explain what's going on. Um, so, 
when it, when we drop a right handle, we now have two maps. Um, one, and they have sort of clones of each other's data. So we need to forget from one and drop from the other. Um, we need to have a mechanism whereby we, uh, hmm, I have hair in my mouth. That was really annoying. Um, we have, um, we have to somehow tell the, the inner type, the absorb type that like uh, drop all the things in this thing. Unfortunately, um, we don't really have a good way of doing so because all we can give it is a mutable reference to itself. Um, the reason for that is if we look at write and the implementation of drop, the right handle, all we have is a mutable reference to it. I guess actually we can make this be owned come to think of it, because we've um, we've swapped it out, we set it to null, and we wait. Yeah, so we actually do know that. So we can actually take and unwrap here. Uh, and that way, that way we can actually drop first. Yeah, so I think we want drop first to actually take self so that it can, um, uh, so that it can actually uh, drop the values safely. So here, drop first is gonna take self. Um, That's going to dereference self. And, and now over an EVM up right, this is now going to be given self. And so we're going to cast self to that type. We could, even if we wanted to here, and maybe that is a good idea is to say that this actually gets a box of self. Oof. Do we really want to forward through box here? It seems dumb, but yeah, I guess we do. Uh, given that we're only doing this for box, we don't really need the macro anymore. Um, this star is going to get weird for any type that's not box. So I think we're actually going to just do this straightforwardly. Unsafe impl t for box t, where t is absorbed that. Um, and now what we do is we transmute it to have manually drop, and then we don't even have to do anything. We can just drop inner. We don't have to clear it first because the values are already marked as manually drop. Mm. So notice that we, uh, you could also unsafe manually drop drop. Um, uh, in, in where we call drop first, I don't think that would work. Cause remember we want to D we want to actually run the destructor for the, the type itself. It's just, there might be alias stuff inside of the type, like the values in the map that are aliased that we don't want to drop. Um, All right, so now back to what we were doing for testing, which is, um, ooh.
Yeah, I guess really this should be a manually drop box, not the other way around. Oh, manually drop into inner. That I'm sure there are other areas that resulted as a part of that, yeah. Um, oh, fine. What? Why does this not? Expected reference box T. Oh. Uh, this, ignore this, it's a silly error. Um, box into raw. I really want this to not be an uh, inside of the wait function. We really shouldn't be like doing into raw. It seems like it's probably a mistake. Like it, it's not actually a problem. It's just like a recipe for shooting yourself in the foot. Um, because here we, we, well, this means we have an owned uh, an owned box, which means that if we happen to panic or something in here, then we're gonna drop that box and things are gonna be sad. Um, well, I guess actually we can do manually drop of this. Um, this being annoying box oh this is doing into raw what am i doing i'm being i think i've been streaming for too long <laughs> this is not doing from raw it's doing into raw this is the part that should be a uh, manually drop new And this should not. <laughs> Expected manually drop box T. Got manually drop box, manually drop T. That seems annoying. Why? That should just be this, is why. All right, what else we got? <sighs> Casting mute box T as mute manually drop T. That should be fine. Oh, that's awful. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, oh. Right, this is now going to uh deref into a mute box t and then we have to deref it again but i thought this would work but apparently not so w handle is a uh manually drop of box it's an option manually drop box um so i guess let's do as mute so that gives me, and then expect. So that gives me a mutable reference to an manually drop of a box. Uh, and then we need to dereference that twice. 
wants to go through the three times wants to go through the mutable reference wants to go through the manually drop wants to go through the box and then a mute of that is a pointer to the actual t uh, and then we cast that now that's obviously terrible i mean the signatures help here right but it's really stupid um but <sighs> I'm surprised that the SDRF mute twice didn't work. Um, uh, all right, I'm just gonna leave that there because it makes me kind of happy, even though it doesn't. Um, <laughs> censored swearing at the compiler, yeah, you're not wrong. Um, doesn't star mute T implicitly cast to mute? Oh, it might. You might be right. I might be able to just do this. Yeah. Good call. Get some implicit cast. Not that that really helped the readability that much, but you know. Um, EV map right RS. Drop first. So we missed something up here. Oh, that's in the tests. Okay, so let's go back and see if that test passes for here in left, right. Right, so I was, I was in the middle of implementing this thing. Um, so <laughs> this one is kind of funny. So the operation can be either a counter operation add uh, I, in which case we and we're gonna do star self plus equals I, or we're gonna do a subtract minus equals I. And would you believe it? The implementation of absorb second is the same. Um, oh, I guess technically this is an unsafe. I don't know if this needs to be an unsafe. I'm undecided whether that's necessary. Uh, and drop first doesn't have to do anything. Um, so as DRF mute twice shouldn't be the same problem as into into because um, DRF has an associated type target. So there's no type inference. Uh, any type can only dereference into one type which is not the same as um, into. Oh, right. <laughs> You're right. Um, because it's assigned, you can, <laughs> because it's assigned, you can just add a negative number. It's true. I mean, this, to be honest, you know what? Let's just, It doesn't matter that this is an enum. Like different types do not matter. So really we're just gonna do this. Self plus equals operation dot zero. Great, even better. And I guess this is now counter add off. Um, all right, so back to our write test. How about we have this test use, um, wait, is there a new in the root? I guess there is, yeah. Um, pend op. Um, I guess we're gonna also use counter add op, and then we're just gonna counter add op 
42. And then we're going to check uh, that r, so r dot enter dot unwrap. We're going to assert that that is equal to, and here comes the magic, 42. Nice. Um, and then we're going to pin it again. It's fine. Oh, uh, create that up. Mm, this doesn't need X. But this does need type annotations, which is going to be I32 and an empty oblog. Um, actually, this is a good point to talk about associated types. So you'll notice that the absorb trait is generic over O. Another alternative would be to have an associated type here. So we could say uh, operation is equal to uh, type operation and then get rid of the O. Um, and there, these are both valid options. <clears throat> um, the distinction comes down to, do you expect that people will want to implement the absorb trait using different operational types, but for the same type? Um, because if you expect people to implement absorb, like my op type one for hash map and someone else to implement my uh, op log type two uh, for hash map. Um, if you do, then it has to be a generic type on the trait. If on the other end, you expect any given type to only have one possible implementation of absorb, like an implementation of ha uh, absorb for hash map will always use the same operational type. Then you make it an associated type. The the so so having it be a generic type parameter is more gen more generic. Like it means you have more flexibility in what implementations you can have. The downside is that um, you need to have a new, for example, needs to be generic over T and O. If O was an associated type of T, we could get rid of this entirely, right? And new would only take one type parameter, which is the type of the of the type that implements absorb. Um, and so that that's more ergonomic because it's constrained to there is only one implementation. Um, this is sort of what I was getting at with DRF and into before that into is has a generic parameter of what type it can be turned into, which means that any given type can be turned into many different types. You can implement the into trait, trait multiple times for a given type. Um, DREF, on the other hand, does not. DREF has an associated type target. And this means that um, you can only DREF a given type into one other type. There's never an ambiguity. There are never multiple implementations. Um, uh, and this means that sometimes when you call into, the compiler's like, I don't know what you want me to turn into. Like, you, there are multiple options here and you need to tell me and you often need to give compiler annotations. Um, whereas that's not true for DREF. For DREF, you will never have to say what type to DREF into because there is only ever one choice. Um, for absorb, I don't know which case makes sense. Um, I guess it's probably unlikely that people will want to bring their own like operational type, but it's not entirely unreasonable, right? Uh, you can imagine that someone wants to support specific operations on like hash map when the key and value is their type. Um, so I'm inclined to leave it at O for now, um, which does sadly mean that new needs to be generic over O, but at least now you know that that was a, a conscious decision. As that means that when we call new here, we have to specify the like comma underscore. The compiler can infer what O should be from what we pass to append op, but it can't infer what T should be because it can be any type that can absorb a counter add op, which as far as the compiler knows, there might be many. Yeah, it does look weird, fine. Is that better? 
Um, See here. I guess this is going to be like a append op counter add op forty two. Actually, that's why this was here, I think, so that this value. When I check it down here, oh, I mean, there's no real reason for this to be different then, because we don't actually check the output value ever. Uh, ooh. Right. Uh, maybe the new function should have some information as to what it creates, kind of like channel. Well, remember, normally you would use this as ev map colon colon new, right? Um, so that's that's why it currently doesn't. Ooh, three oh three. What do I do here? Right now, the read handle has to be mutable. Okay. Great, so the tests in left-right work, um, they don't do anything particularly interesting, but at least it checks that refreshes are happening. Um, the real like, big question is gonna be around the evmap tests. So let's go to evmap read. Um, so these tests could, oh, some of these are very specific to EV. Oh, I guess this one is very specific to evmap. Um, this only needs to be mute. I think that should just work. So that's nice, right? So the EVMAP API has stayed almost exactly the same. Um, okay, so all the <clears throat> the EVMAP like unit tests uh, succeed. They don't do anything pretty, particularly interesting, but this is just we didn't like majorly screw up somewhere. Um, now is where it gets really interesting, which is to run the full EVMAP test suite, and that's going to be much more of a pain. Um, I think many of these, so these are the, the library tests for EVMAP, and I think many of these, it makes a lot of sense for us to uh, sort of port over into, um, port over into left, right, but we can keep them here from now. It doesn't, like, because EVMAP hasn't really changed, uh, it should be fairly trivial for us to port these over. So, for example, uh, oh, anything that has calls read should instead call enter. Um, anything that has R comma should probably be, oops, uh, oh my, anything that has R, R comma should probably be mute R comma. And that's probably gonna make most of the test compile already. This apparently doesn't need to be mutable. Um, this does have to be mutable. This doesn't have to be mutable, but the clone does. This doesn't have to be mutable, but the clone does. And yeah, so this is all, EVMAP is also set up with quick test. Um, so that's probably gonna account for most of the other compile differences. But the change here is fairly mechanical. 261 is probably another mutable thing. Yeah, this needs to be mute. What else we got? Two, two, three. This thing does not need to be. Oh, it definitely does. What else we got? 
Uh, this needs a mutable reference to the read handle now. Mutable reference to the read handle, mutable reference to the read handle. Ooh, that's gonna be bad. I'm gonna skip, oh, is that the only one? All right, what do we got here? A dot enter dot iter dot map. Um, so this is one example of where um, it was kind of nice for read handle to only take an immutable a shared reference because we could do things like enter but then also call get. Um, which it won't really let us do anymore. Um, hmm. But to be honest, I don't know what this would even end up doing. I feel like this would end up doing something kind of stupid. Mm. The basic observation here is that if you call enter, you should be allowed to call enter again, right? There's nothing really preventing you from doing that. But in the current API, we are restricting the caller from doing this. Um, if they call enter and then then that, get, that takes a mutable reference to self and it ties the lifetime of that mutable borrow into the read guard that it returns, which means that you can't then borrow again. Um, but what we might be able to do is guard is a dot enter guard iter and guard get uh, enter unwrap Guard, so this, I think this is guard.keys. I don't know why there's a flatten. Great. Actually, that's not too bad. <laughs> I guess we are at like the six hour mark, huh? Mm, quick test generates like random test inputs, yeah. Uh, what's the meaning of M when you use percent SM? Uh, magic. Uh, this makes this makes Vim regular expressions uh, interpret more things as special characters. I should really make that alias be using very magic instead, but which is V. Oh, well, it does pretty well. Operation string did something weird. Like 146. Of course, of course, that's the one we just did. Um, uh, all right, so this is going to be if let some guard is this, then uh, guard else I see in the past this would actually here we want to assert uh, I see so really what this is saying is that it failed to enter, which means the map has been destroyed, um, but it's already checked that the, the reference map and the, and the current map are the same length. So really, if this is destroyed, that means we've already done the testing we need. Reference was empty. Uh, read handle was destroyed. 
So all is well. Maybe. Uh, return true. Uh, something failed. Oh, these are doc tests. That is a good sign when only the doc tests are failing. Yep, this needs to be mute. Hmm. Oh, I'm almost positive some of this is gonna be bad. This is gonna be mute. Actually, this is not going to be mute. This is going to be mute. Um, this is going to be mute. Um, this is no longer true. Read handle is sync. Nice. I guess let's do doc. Um, the, the read guard didn't need mute self before because it was using atomics internally in itself um, to allow it to just take ref self. The thing is, it doesn't actually need mute self um, because most of what it's doing is just operating on the epic counter anyway. Um, which is which is anyway shared. Like you need to use atomics for it regardless. Um, but it's sort of like hiding the fact that really it's mutating some state. It's just it's a little misleading, right? Because when you see a read handle take mute self, you think that it mutates the map. But it it has an immutable reference to the map. It just has a mutable reference to its own internal state, like the handle state. Um, which is a little subtle. All right, what do we got? What else is failing? Book reviews are... That does need to be mutable. Uh, what else we got here? Right on line 32. That has to be mutable. Thirty-four. What? I mean, eighty-six. That's very misleading. Source lib rs line thirty-four. Source lib rs line eighty-six. I know it's because of doc comments having. This is line thirty-four of the example, but that's annoying. Eighty-six. Um, no method read for strike. Ah, this has to be enter. Nice. That's pretty promising. Let's run cargo Miri test too. Oh. Uh. I thought it was, is Miri like not available these days? I know there's been like a bit of ups and downs. That's annoying. Uh, tool state. No. Tool state. No, Miri is supposed to be building. Oh, it's missing on tonight's nightly. That's really annoying. Well, all right, that's fine. Um, I'll run Miri later. I guess the last thing, we'll do a cargo Clippy here. Oh, Clippy's just happy. Great. What about here? All right, this is pretty nice. Uh, I guess what I'll do is I'll go ahead and commit all of this. Did I read, did I leave any to-dos? I did. Read. Uh, left, right, read. 126. 
Oh, we already fixed that to do. Great. Um, I guess we might as well get, oh, EVMap Derive was using the wrong version, but that's fine. Um, it's easy enough for us to fix, I think, because Derive Cargo, this can just be version 11.0.0 alpha.1. I think that's the version I've set. Yeah. Uh, why not run Miri on stable? It wouldn't install for me on stable, but maybe I was doing something silly. Uh, this also says broken introdoc links. Oh, Nightkin is in. Um, the mutable reference feels kind of unergonomic and is a very breaking change. Is it possible to use some unsafe magic to take an immutable reference? It is. The trick here is going to be to use a um, to use a cell, and then keep track of how many times we enter. Um, so, oh, I really don't want to deal with that right now. I don't know why. Oh, the failing one is, oh man. Oh, the compiler has changed. Uh, yeah, that's what we want to do. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we can do that pretty easily, actually. If we if we really want to, we can do that. Um, so that's uh, going to be not guard, but um, all right. So okay. Um, we have two options here. One is to keep the handle as use it, taking a mutable reference. And that makes these things nice. And it also allows read handle to be sync. Um, the other alternative is to do a little bit of cell hacking here, uh, which would make read not be sync but would allow it to take immutable, immutable references um, to self, that is. I mean, maybe it's worth it. Um, it'll add a bunch of internal complexity, but maybe it's not too bad. Basically, what we have to keep track of is if you enter multiple times, you should still only reset the epic when the last thing gets, when the last guard gets dropped. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's true. All right. So let's do that. We might as well. Um, so in that case, we're going to use uh, cell cell. Uh, and enters. It's going to be use as. Um, and then what we're going to do is Uh, 
So enters is going to be a count of the number of times enter has been called without the guard having been dropped. So whenever that goes, um, if we call enter while that value is uh, one or greater, then we do nothing. We just give out a guard. And when we drop a guard, we check whether that value has reached zero, and only if it reaches zero do we reset the epic. Um, all right, so in that case, my epic is going to be cell new zero, and enters is also going to be cell new zero. Um, So let's see, if self enters is not zero, we have already locked the epic. Just give out another guard. Um, so actually this is tricky because I oh, know we are preventing another swap. So this should be safe to do. Um, which only happens when the last read guard is dropped. Um, and then if it's, and then we're really going to do like, uh, I guess an R hand, no, we'll just do it this way. Uh, this is just going to return. So we're just going to give out, um, oh, what am I doing wrong here? Uh, because we know that the, a previous enter has happened, uh, we know that we don't need to bump the epic. The epic is already locked. So we can just read the pointer, cast it to a reference. Uh, if, that, or if the pointer is none, then we just return none. Um, and if that point, this shouldn't be possible. In that case, we didn't give out a guard, so no guard was dropped. So this should be unreachable. Uh, if, if pointer is null, no read guard should have been issued. Because if you look down here, it's only really here that we're going to do self dot enters uh, dot, I guess, enters is self enters get plus one set enters. So it's only here that we increment. We're not going to increment in the in the else clause. Um, and so in this case, we're going to do self, we're going to do the same thing. Um, enters is self enters get uh, if enters not equal zero and then we're gonna uh, enters set uh, enters plus one uh, and the epic here is just my epic I'm pretty sure let Epic is read after it's incremented, so that's what's set there. So this is just self my epic get. Um, that means this is self plus one set epic. Great. Uh, 
it is funny that the struct has yeah four fields that all say epic in it. Um, um, I can't use fetch add because this is a cell. I don't think cell has fetch add. It's not as far somewhere. Um, okay, so what we're missing now is um, oh. What we're missing now is that the guard, when you drop a guard, um, I think really I want this to be a reference to self. Yeah, that has to be a reference to self. The guard is going to hold a reference to Oh, this is why I didn't want to do that. Oh, balls. Uh can't uh I don't want to have to give the type of the handle as an additional generic parameter to the guard, right? Because the guard has um the guard T is a, the generic type parameter of the currently guarded value, which might be different from the overall type of the handle. Uh, we can get around this though uh, by uh, only giving it this information it needs. Uh, read handle state. Uh, which is gonna take uh, this and it's gonna hold a handle. That is awful. It's gonna hold an epic. I guess it's like shared handle, own handle. It's so stupid. Uh, and it needs a reference to the enters. And this is gonna now have a pub super um, handle, which is a read handle state. And crucially, the only thing it's really leaving out is the, the, the actual pointer type, which is what gives read handle its T. Um, and then we're going to do impl, oops, nope. I'm going to do impl um, from read from ah, read handle t for read handle state, just to make it a little bit nicer to use. a self this is why the the mute version is nicer um, R R H epic uh, oh, this should also not be called handle this should be called epic and the own epic is gonna be our my epic and the enters is going to be RA enters. That's going to be super. And I guess this will derive debug. Sure, why not? Um, and th that actually works. Great. This, I guess, is probably both copy and clone. Um, crucially, the drop is going to have to be um, let enters is self dot handle dot enters dot get uh, minus one, and then handle dot enters dot set. Uh, enters 
Uh, if enters is zero, then we're going to do this, which is handle dot uh, shared epic dot store is going to be self dot. Uh, this is also not right. Uh, I feel like we need to update our own epic as well here. Um, is there a benefit to using cell U64 over atomic U64? Yeah, it avoids atomics. It's faster. Um, all right, well, let's, the, we certainly have to update the shared epic. This is going to be handle own, own epic. Uh, oh my God, that epic is self.handle.own epic. Um, huh? Dot get. Um, we are the last guard to be dropped. Now reset, uh, release our epic. Um, So this should now be, I forget what it's called. It's going to be guard read. <laughs> uh, this needs to be pub super read handle state from self. From self. And same thing down here. Um, I remember why I even have my epic. It's because my epic is the current epic with the high bit never set. So, um, yeah, so th the implementation considers the epic number just be a number that keeps incrementing by one. It doesn't actually care about even odd. And then it's using the high bit is either set or not set for whether it's idle or active, I guess. Um, so my epic here, the cell, only ever holds the current like round, which only ever goes up by one. Uh, and so this is why when the guard gets dropped, we don't actually change the the cell U64, the 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 my epic, um, because that one should only be incremented when you increase it. All we have to do is reset the the idle bit. Um, this could probably be made nicer by just having it be even odd, but you know it's fine. Um, so crucially, what this enables us to do is. That all, uh, did I already do that? Right, is that in, in evmap read, yeah, which also means that in read ref, I thought, I guess not. Right now we're gonna get now we're gonna get a ton of warnings about the mutable stuff again. So let's just go ahead and get rid of all those. Uh, we do still have to do the read change to be enter. All right, where else, where else does this show up? Test quick. 
Nice. It is a lot nicer when reads can actually be reads. I'll still keep this the way it was because that seems nice. Um, what else we got? Right. Uh, EV map read. EV map map re read ref. Something's not right. Read RS 243. This doesn't need to be. Ah. Um. All right, so cargo check. Just check the lib for me, please. I guess cargo test lib. Uh, so right, ah, right. So that can go away. That makes me happy. I go test. This is a really annoying. I'm pretty sure this is a really annoying issue. I think in cargo where notice that the tests still require R to be mutable, um, and that's because it relies on the pre the previous build of EV map. I don't quite know why that is, why it does that. That's real annoying. So I guess the only way I know of to fix this is either to clear your cache or to increment the version of the thing you're building. Um, so which basically just forces a rebuild of everything. Still doesn't quite work, huh? Okay, EV map test. Oh, EV map cargo. This is gonna have to use version 091. Really? Why? I clearly missed the mute self somewhere. But where is the real question? Um, well, we shouldn't need the DRF mute anymore. We can still provide it, but it's it's less interesting. But why on earth? Am I blind? I am blind. <sighs> what? Oh, EV map read. That's, I'm dumb. There we go. All right. So I maybe lied, but it is a problem I've seen before, but I'm guessing it probably did not happen this time. Ooh. EV map right DRF mute. We no longer need to import that, which also means in left, right, right, we also don't need to import that. All right, let's see if the test pass again. Fantastic. Okay, so now, um, in theory, the diff we have now should be fairly small. Um, that we can ignore. Uh, oh, did I not change that to not be alpha two anymore? I mean, I'll need to eventually, but. Mm. Cargo T doc. Those should all be giving warnings, which I'm guessing are silenced. We 
because they no longer need to be mutable. What about here? What we got here? Do you have any examples that we need to update here? No, I don't think so. All right. Think we're I think we're just about there. Yeah, that just changed from read to enter. That's fine. Uh, I guess I should bring back the text about um, read handle not being sync. Or slip somewhere. I guess really it should go in the documentation for. Um, really it should go in the documentation for left right. Like I'm gonna have to write documentation for left right anyway. I just haven't done so yet. Um, and much of that is probably just gonna get like cribbed from. Uh, cribbed from EV map proper. That's something I don't think I'm gonna do on stream because my voice is getting hoarse. Um, but it should also be fairly uninteresting. Like it's just moving text around. Um, operation now takes M, which is a little sad, but not too bad. Um, I think we simplified the types a decent amount. We removed the need for, oh, we do need to bring back factory now. Because read guard is no longer sync. Um, that's a little awkward. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to have to bring back read guard factory. Which is pretty sad. Um, not even sure where I would put that, to be honest. Mm. I mean, read guard factory is the other reason why I want it to be, why I'd sort of like it to be sync, but I also agree that it's nicer for it to not take mute self. I don't know. Read guard factory is, is pretty simple though. It's just a bunch of like mechanical restoration of what we had. Um, I'm going to leave that alone. Um, this stuff didn't really change. I, I'm really just scanning through to see what, um, whether I missed any like mute arts or anything, but I don't think so. Yeah, this changed to enter, but that's mostly uninteresting. That seems fine, that seems fine. All right, I think we're good. I think that's all I wanted to do for today. I, I'll, I'll take some time uh, probably offline to like tidy this up and like write up the docs and, and release left right as a crate. But this suggests that this actually works, um, that this approach of having a generic left right wrapper type works. Um, and what's neat is that once I land this, you'll be able to use left right to provide your own uh, types that you want really fast read concurrency for, um, but you're willing to say that there's a single writer. Whew, I need to go eat some food and drink some water. Um, thanks everyone for coming out. I hope it was interesting. I know it, was, it ended up being a pretty long stream, um, but that was sort of the intention, right? For this to be a, a like serious live coding stream again. Um, I see we still have a decent number of people with us. No benchmark, that's true. But remember, like benchmark-wise, there's no reason to believe that this would change anything um, because we haven't changed the algorithm, right? The algorithm is the same. Uh, the only reason why anything would slow down would be because of like, like generics not being monomorphized. But generics should be monomorphized. Um, it would be like crossing crate boundaries, which could matter. Uh, in terms of EV maps specifically, I would say it probably doesn't matter because the concern is about the scalability of reads. If each read is a little slower, 
that doesn't bother me. I, hopefully it isn't, but that doesn't bother me. What bothers me is the curve. If we're no longer linear, like if the read performance is no longer linear in the number of readers, that would be a huge problem. Um, but because we haven't changed the algorithm, that shouldn't make a difference. I will point some benchmarks at some point, but um, you could maybe use Bustle to benchmark this. You could try. I don't know. Give it a try. Um, I'll probably post this as like a work in progress PR so people can look at it. Uh, put it on GitHub somewhere. Um, but apart from that, I think I think we're done for today. Thanks for coming out. Hope you had fun. Hope it was interesting. And I'll see you next time, probably in like a few weeks. Bye, everyone.